Good evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio, everybody. Welcome. My name is Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters, and we are so glad to have each and every one of you in here tonight as we got the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. Yes, the guru is back, and it is time for some spooky story time. And we're going to get into everything from lake monsters, sea monsters, and whatever monster you want to get into tonight. That's what we're doing on the big show. Before we bring in the guru, let's say hello to everyone in the chat room tonight. Look who's in the gold medal position. It is Chad Smith, everybody. Chad Smith. We didn't rig it, nothing. Chad did that all on his own. Yes, this is why we are all Chad Smith people. Gorgeous Jenny Metz taking home the silver. And with the bronze medal tonight, race fan, gorgeous Patty B, how are you? Thanks for coming on in. Really appreciate you. The stunning Cosmic Fleur. Andrew, how you doing? Smith, Smithy, what's going on, buddy? And uh, Black Dragon, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Really do appreciate your love and support of Spaced Out Radio, my friend. Thank you so much. And Chefist and Chefist Mustache, how you doing? They are two separate entities, so we do have to uh, say hello to both. Here we go. There's Florida Steph Dickey looking lovely tonight. Thank you for joining us. As we scroll on down to who's next? Mennonite Abe, everybody. Mennonite Abe is here. How you doing, Abe? Good to have you here, my friend. And there's Todd Purden. And uh, let's see, who else do we have? scrolling on down scrolling on down way down there's sj sj has arrived there he is all right uh nicola good to see you thanks for coming on in and there's carrie ann from central pennsylvania she says she's ready for some guru time right there and uh, Carrie Ann, by the way, will be uh, signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Stephen Edmund, good to have you here. Thanks for joining us as we continue on. GF, 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 G is here. He'll, uh, he or she, or GF, GF, G, will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right. So you got Carrie Ann on the left, GF, 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 G on the right. And we appreciate that. Grand Paul Holland, good to have you here from Australia. There's gorgeous Laura Stevens, everyone. Give us a wave, Laura, if you don't mind. Mama Susan, good to see you as we continue. There's 416 Bitcoin. And scrolling on down, Uncle Dale and his power stash are here. Remember, if you're in Austin, Texas, if you find Uncle Dale, rub his power stash for three weeks of good luck. That uh, three weeks expires at the end of September. The Philip Matlock is here, everyone. The Philip Matlock. There's Spooky Morales. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Uh, Richard Elmore, Chillin' Villain, Fidgety Aura. Nice to have you all here. There's the gorgeous Bat Mom. She's waving her wings to everyone who's uh, waving back. The lovely Anne Celine from KPNL. Uh, there's Kat from Paranormal Heart Podcast. How you doing, Kat? You look lovely tonight. Millennium, nice to see you, my friend. Good to have you here as we scroll on down. Andy Jones, nice to have you here. And moving on down, A.A. Ron, how you doing, buddy? 5900 buck. good to see you. Vin Man, nice to have you here. And uh, Murray F., thank you so much for that awesome super chat, buddy. Really do appreciate uh, my fellow Canadian there, Murray, hanging on out with us. And I better start the radio feed. Hold on, because that's kind of important. And moving on here as we are just getting uh, closer to showtime, the lovely Jenny White Bear, lovely Lauren, how you doing? Go 66, boo to you. And I mean that in a positive way. Ian Burwell, thanks for coming on in. The gorgeous Tammy Finnegan, nice to have you back. Sweet Donnie D, what's happening? Molotov, it's been a while. Nice to have you back here. Uh, Glenn John McEnroe, the pride of Wimbledon. Double Tim, nice to have you here. And uh, Sir Brian Bowden, there he is, 18,486 podcasts, all broadcasting simultaneously. Stu Gerson, right there. Hey, Batmon, thank you so much for that awesome super chat. Really do appreciate that. Super chat is a great way to support what we do here on a nightly basis, and it really supports what we do. Thank you so much. Chuck Elliott, good to see you. I'm going to miss a few here because we got to get going. Let's get ready to get your horns up. Steve Stockton, KPNL. Here we go, everyone.
the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, at KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio and on Instagram, spaced out radio show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. The man known as the Crypto Guru is back. One of my favorite friends and authors, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. He is known as the guru around here because literally he is the guru when it comes to everything cryptid, paranormal, supernatural, and he writes about it. And this is why he is an award-winning author. A scholarly man, he takes his words very delicately and literally romanticizes the monsters that scare us at night. And we are so proud to have him here telling us some fabled stories as we get into lake monsters, sea monsters, and any monster that our audience wants to hear of later on in the show. The Guru, always a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio, my friend. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm awesome, awesome man. You're too kind, as a matter of fact. Uh, every time I'm on here, you give me a glowing review, and you have my head swollen for about a week and a half. But uh, there's truly no place I'd rather be at uh, 12 a.m. my time until 3 o'clock my time than with you and your Spaced Out listener, Russ, listeners. Spaced Out radio listeners, I, I cannot wait. Well, you know what? We're, I want people to get to know you a little bit because you are an educated man. You, mm-hmm. I believe you have your, your master's in, is it history? I do, I do, yeah. And I actually um, just, uh, uh, well, it was, been t- it was two years in August. Um, I got my uh, 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 master's uh, in uh, counseling from Temple University. So uh, I, I've been doing a lot. I, I, I worked with uh, families for most of my adult life, uh, working with uh, at-need and at-risk children, and I've been working as an elder advocate uh, for a number of years as well. Um, so a lot of the things that people would know about me is that I, I, I deal a lot with uh, childhood education and not only with the uh, education of children, um, but also in the realms of making sure that these children are taken care of. So I work with families who are at risk for whatever reasons, whether it's poverty or whether it's um, some sort of substance abuse, uh, trying to get them on the right track and just trying to be the voice for a lot of people that have been silenced for too long. That's awesome, buddy. That is completely awesome that you take the time to do that. Because I know as a single father of five, your day is already busy. Where do you find time to write between uh-huh. all of this? You know, I, I think about that as well, too. Um, I always have a little notebook with me. So even if I can't, you know, whip out the uh, computer, I have my little notebook to, to, to jot down um, ideas. Uh, so, I mean, it, it is difficult Um, But I think there's a passion there. You have to have a passion. If you don't, then none of this stuff will come to fruition. Um, So, I mean, I have a passion for helping people, and I also have a passion for writing. And I think that whenever you have those kind of diversities in your life, you'll you'll make time to make sure that uh, both of them get addressed. Now, the one problem that I have in working my, my, my real job is there's a lot of toxicity in there. You know, you have things like called hereditary toxicity that is very contagious. So there are times whenever I have to take a time out and I have to just sit back and say, okay, I can't do this right now. And that happens a good bit. You know, you have to take some personal time for healing. Um, But really one of the ways that I heal and that I kind of work uh, at my own um, uh, self-awareness is through my writing. So it's kind of a... uh, uh, a therapy, a therapy for me. Everybody needs an escape. You use monsters as an escape. Why did you choose monsters to write about? Yeah. And not just not just fabled stories, mm-hmm. but you're going after real monsters that people are having alleged encounters with. Right, right. Well, I think that that is that that's something that's been instilled with me since I've been a kid with my mom. 
Uh, my mom would, you know, sh she was a fanatic whenever it came to stories of Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and UFOs. And she really was there in my formative years, uh, not only, uh, you know, to, to show me about the books and read these books to me, uh, but also, you know, let me see all these great movies like The Legend of Boggy Creek whenever I was just a kid. And this really kind of um, uh, formulized uh, who I was going to be. So what I, I did, and, and, you know, everybody has this natural fear of the dark. And what I do, I mean, even to this day, I still sleep with a nightlight on. But what I, I try to do is shed a little bit of light into those shadows. Find out what's over there. Because it, it, what, what haunts me and what terrifies me is the same thing that haunts you and terrifies you. And whenever you connect all the dots, it seems as if these are the same things that haunt us throughout the ages and across the world, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, creed or color or whatever. Um, so it's part of our human identity, these monsters are. And I've said before that they are actually embroidered into our DNA. Um, these creatures uh, need us as much as we need them. And whenever I say that we need them, is they put us in our place. They remind us that we have not conquered every single mystery in life. Uh, they remind us of our own, own mortality. And they also remind us, they're also a warning of what we can be if we continue to go down the road that we are on. Um, a lot of these creatures like vampires and werewolves, um, at the end of the day, uh, it is almost like a Scooby-Doo cartoon. And you take off the werewolf mask or the vampire mask. And lo and behold, there is a regular human being underneath there. Uh, we project a lot of ourselves onto these so-called monsters. They take the place of what we don't want to admit that human beings are capable of doing. Um, we are a very heinous species that can do incredibly bad things, as well as doing incredibly noble and worthwhile things. So these kind of monsters encapsulate the good in us and the bad in us, and that is really the kind of way I approach the paranormal. And a lot of people don't do it that way. Um, I look at the archetype. I look to see how these monsters have evolved uh, over the, the millennia and what they mean to us this very day. And whenever I do my research, I try to go back as far into the historical record as I can, uh, look at archaeological evidence and hints and conjectures uh, that are out there regarding these creatures that are, are, have all been lost in the sands of time. Normally, I don't take questions for hour number two, but you brought up the fact that you still sleep with a nightlight. Sure. So, Sky Sites over on Twitch, tuning us in, and thank you, Sky Sites, for joining us tonight, says, I got a question. Where do you think the idea of closing your eyes for safety from certain creatures comes from? You know, that's actually a very, very good idea, uh, a very good notion. So, it's probably very ancient. Um, I do know for a fact, and I, I, I will give you a precedent on this, um, it was believed in the Middle Ages uh, and in the Renaissance particularly uh, that um, magic was something that happened internally on the person. And we projected into the world this particular magic. And a lot of people saw as this projection as through the eyes. The eyes are the gateway to the soul. And by closing our eyes, we do not allow what is inside of us to appear or materialize within our own world. I think that's where a lot of it comes from. But I think whenever we look at this from a, a purely biological level, is that we're taking control of the situation. Uh, we are we are not admitting that something is out there. Um, it's the same way whenever you know you were a kid and you thought that there was something in your closet, so you pulled the covers up over your head. Um, I, I think that we as a a a, a species have collectively pulled the cover up over our head. And I believe that in order to get to this, this truth out there, we need to uh, take a peek over the covers every uh, once in a while. Uh, we have to take a peek in the closet, and we have to become friends with that monster that lives under our bed. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is here with us tonight on Spaced Out Radio. You know, I haven't slept with a nightlight for a long time, but man, there are times when I've woken up out of bed, man, and I swear there's monsters around. Sure. When you get that feeling, and many of us do, we, we chalk it up to nightmares, we chalk it up to imagination, 
How many times are those monsters really there, my friend? Well, see, I, these are all very interesting questions, and I'm glad that we're getting right to the uh, the, the the heart of the matter. You know, uh, very early in, but but that that is really what I'm getting at, Dave. So we have this instinct within us to feel that there's something out there that is beyond our control. So it's that ancient flight or fight response that we have latent in all of us. You know, it, it originates the time that we were still in the savanna and we were not the apex predator. And there were, you know, we were prey to other creatures. And it's kind of that tingling sensation that you know that there's something out there and it's for self-preservation. Um, something is triggering that. Um, what that something is, I do not know. Um, I've never encountered a monster, uh, even though that I have had this, you know, these, these experiences, these feelings, but something biologically in me is telling me that there is danger out there. Now, is this something that's vestigial and, you know, it's, 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 it's rather atrophied and every now and then kicks on for no apparent reason. I don't think so. I think that there is something out in that environment that, that, you know, that we call life that, you know, is, is unexplained, Un, uncontrollable and possibly even unknowable that we can sometimes tap into and we know that it's not in our best interest to go any further. Okay. So if, if we know it's in our best interest not to go any further, how do we, how do we define, you know, as we try to, de, to, to draw that line of sanity to insanity, if I could right. use those terms, what is real and what is imagination? Right. You know, because well, I can tell you, you know, point blank, I have had experiences where I have woken up in the middle of the night and I've been so afraid that if I look down the hall, yeah. that there's an alien going to be an alien over there right. that, that I, I literally throw the covers over my head. Right. You know, I've had that experience. I have had other experiences, you know, where I'm lying in bed and all of a sudden I felt my leg get picked up. Yes. And I said, can you, I said, not tonight. Can you please put my leg down? And my leg goes back down, freaked right. me right out. Yeah. Okay. I've had that. So, and a lot of other people have had other same type of similar occurrences. So how do we know what is real true and what is just, you know, fallacy? Right. Well, I, I, how, how do we know that those experiences aren't genuine? You know, how do we know that what we are thinking in our mind isn't actually the fact that's going on? Um, you know, people used to say about, you know, night terrors and all this other stuff, um, that, you know, it's caused by this sleep paralysis. Um, but, but how do we know that the essence of all this stuff, the essence of the succubus and the incubus still is, isn't with us today? And we simply write them off because it's so, so archaic that we have to prescribe, you know, ascribe to it a, a, a new name now. Um, I'm really not of the opinion that all of our experiences are made up or psychological or in the mind. Um, how do we know that there's not an alien down down the, the hallway? Or how do we know that something has not seeped into our world while we're laying in bed? See, these are all questions that I keep on coming up with. And whenever I keep the light, night light on, that's a little bit of that demarcation between my world and their world that I'm hoping that there's an unspoken trust there that they will not infringe upon. But absolutely, my friend, look, these stories have been going on since the very beginning of history. One of the first things that has ever been written down, uh, you know, as part of the human being is talking about, you know, wild man encounters in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so there is definitely something out there that has been haunting us and not just individuals, but haunting us as a human race. And, and we, you know, we've called them monsters, but, but I think there is something much more, um, elemental to it than just being monsters. I think it's something that we are aware of um, instinctually, but we have not put a name on it yet. Um, so I have no reason to doubt that if a person says they have this feeling that there's something in that room with them, that it could be actually something more than just a feeling. Well, let me ask you, because we have a, a, hidden obsession each and every one of us mm. of the love of getting scared mm. we watch horror movies suspense movies 
you know, everything from Nightmare on Elm Street to Insidious to Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity. Mm -hmm. And we love being scared. We love having that feeling of fright. Does that play a role into these monsters that we want to see and our imagination creating them for us? Or is there a lot more reality to it? Um, well, from a biological point of view, uh, the same area of our brain that elicits fear is the same part of our brain that gives us um, joy and, you know, and happiness. So it's almost like that entertainment section of our brain. Um, for instance, like a lot of people, whenever they go on roller coasters, uh, they'll laugh or if they go into a haunted house and something jumps out of them, they'll have that nervous laughter. That's because it comes from the same place. Um, I think, uh, see, these are all very difficult questions. <laughs> I think, I think that when we, we, we start dissecting them, they become even more complicated. Um, the, uh, because our world is so crazy, it seems as if monsters have become our entertainment. Um, if we think about, about a few years ago, whenever the world started to go a little bit haywire and zombies became the big thing, right? Um, and zombies are really another version of us. You know, they are the monster without the mask and their origin story is the same origin stories of, 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 our, of, of us. So these kind of creatures show us what happens in a world that is upside down and it's confusing. Um, the same way with this idea of these uh, UFOs and these UFO reports coming out. Um, one of the reasons why these things are being slowly leaked out, I think, is to uh, not only to appease people's curiosity, uh, but also a little bit to show that we really don't know what's going on out there. Um, so, again, Dave, this is a very difficult situation, a very difficult question. But culturally, we need these monsters to represent something that we're lacking or something that we are afraid of. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I write about this stuff, because these same monsters have existed throughout the ages. Um, they're just interpreted differently by different cultures at different times. So if I li listen to what you're saying, are you saying that we are more creating our own tulpas? In many cases, I think, especially I, I, I've been investigating hauntings for a while. And um, about, about 95% of the hauntings uh, that I investigate, and you probably know this from experience as well, too, um, they're not terrifying. Um, usually whenever somebody encounters, um, a force that they consider a ghost, it's usually something that's very reassuring. There's usually, um, uh, a little instance of fear there because it's something out of the usual, but it's never something to be terrified about. Now you have that 5% whenever people talk about demons and such, I believe that those, you know, rare 5% of hauntings are creations from our own mind that are unleashed into this world. And I think that tulpas do exist. I mean, this is actually coming from Eastern philosophy. Um, in many cultures, uh, things such as the Yeti are believed to be tulpas because so many people believe in that kind of creature that straddles the world between uh, the mundane and the uh, supernatural or the metaphysical. Um, so I think that we can indeed project from ourselves these types of creatures onto the world around us. Um, but a tulpa is far different than an archetype. And what my main interest is the idea of the archetype is something that is relatively unchanging and relatively rigid in the way that they have been betrayed over the years. Like, you know, like, like werewolves and wild men. And if we get into the idea of sea monsters and lake monsters later, um, these creatures very, very rarely change. Um, one creature that we can really look at uh, and discuss about how an evolution happens is with a chupacabra. 
you know, um, this is kind of like the new kid on the block. And originally it was um, identified and described as something that looked like almost like a, um, uh, a satanic porcupine. You know, it had this long flickering tongue and these big red eyes, and it was covered in these kind of sharp spines. And now it has evolved into this blue dog that runs amok in Texas, you know. So we see that the evolutions do happen here. And, and, and our culture will define what kind of monster they want to have. So I think a chupacabra in and of itself could never be identified as an archetype. Uh, possibly what it stands for could, but not an archetype in and of itself. And that's the reason why I look at things like witches and the things like vampires and, and lake monsters and such, because very rarely do they change year to year or uh, a subsequent generation to generation. We got two and a half minutes before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is with us. And, Ron, right before that, we go to the break where we're going to switch over to sea monsters, nice. for you, how much fun is it researching all of these childhood monsters? Oh, man. I'll tell you what. Whenever I first started it, and I did it as a form of catharsis. You know, that's the reason why I go into the woods and why I do the things that I do is because as, as a kid, I was naturally attracted to Bigfoot, but I was, at, you know, naturally repulsed by something like that as well, too, and very fearful of such a thing that lived out in the woods. So one of the reasons why I go out there is to find proof of what kind of things are out there. Um, and it's it's awesome. I mean, it, this is the best job in the world of research. I never see it as work. I see it as almost, uh, you know, um, uh, almost like a fun endeavor for me to go and research for hours on end about these creatures that I've I've had such a close relationship with. No, very true, very true. For you, as you have battled to to gain your ground in the popularity level of this field, how what has been your your biggest success so far? Um, I, I think finding my little niche there and, and, and coming at the world of the paranormal in the way that I do. Um, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm an expert on all this kind of stuff. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I've, I've um, encountered any of these creatures. I'm saying that these are all question marks out there. So I approach the world of the paranormal the same way your listeners do, with a lot of questions and with a lot of um, a, a, a lot of research to do to try to get to the bottom of this. And I'm also very um, content on never getting to the bottom of this. This might be something that always is a mystery. And in a way, I'm kind of happy if it is always a mystery because we shouldn't, as a human being, know everything that's out there. There should always be these hidden places that keep us honest. Oh, very true. Very true. In a field where there's a lot of dishonesty, trying to be honest is one of the hardest parts of what we do it's on right. a daily basis because you're always fighting it. That's right. And I think that that's the thing. And that's a good point that you made there. And I think that that was very um, eloquently said as well. Like, how do you find your 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 niche in, in this field? Because there's so many people occupying almost every angle. I think the way to do it is you 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 maintain your honesty, uh, you maintain your integrity, um, you don't go off the deep end, and uh, you definitely don't go around pretending that you know everything, and you also don't go around uh, gallivanting that you know you're there to summon demons and things like that, like a lot of ghost hunters are doing. The crypto guru Ronald Murphy. When we come back, Guru is going to give us some time on sea monsters, lake monsters. Everything from the Kraken and Chupacabra to the lizard-like beings swimming in our lakes of North America. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Flying by, man. That was a fast half hour. That was very fast. <clears throat> Looking good, Guru. I appreciate that, man. And a lot of people are still staying on. Nobody said, all oh, this show sucks and jumped off right not yet. not yet not yet well we hit that hard the first half hour that was some pretty deep did. there we did that's okay though we can take that yeah we can take that these listeners can take that mm -hmm. hey the the dirt road mystic said fantastic show and see, I like that kind of feedback. Um, normally, whenever I do any kind of shows, you don't get that kind of immediate feedback. And I do like to see that. 
Hello, gorgeous Jennifer Hawkins. The stunning Katie is back. How are you? The lovely Helena. Uh, okay, Jeremy Jones. Uh, Ronald looks like he's going to take us on a safari. We are a safari of the mind. Mm -hmm. People love their guru, man. You can't make this shit up. People love mind. their guru. Yancy, how you doing, buddy? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like bat moms. She throws in a super chat earlier on in the show, and then she goes, this show sucks. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. She says, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you stunned me there for a second, gorgeous bat mom. Stunned me there for a second. <clears throat> I like YJ here. YJ's in British Columbia here. Tonight's guest looks like he could take down a Wolverine with his bare hands. Bare hands, man. Bare hands. Absolutely. Uh -huh. That's the reason. That's the way I want to look, uh, because obviously I could not do that. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of, um, um, uh, I guess, a confession here. Um, I do not own a toolbox. Not only do I not own a toolbox, I don't know how to use most tools. Me either. So if I, yeah, see, that's good. So we need to look like we can fight off Wolverine. So people, that increases our street cred. Uh, well, absolutely. Unless you live in a in a big city where you know you got to deal with the hipsters. Yes, that's, exactly. that's the only problem. Yeah. All hey, right, Joe hey, Brian, Brian Bowden has a new podcast called called "How Can You Not Love This Great Guy Podcast." <laughs> Starting up in about six minutes here. All right, that'll be in number nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he's, he's doing one right now. Hey, get it. If you can have a uh, uh, Joe Monk says, yeah, I love that. We we need to talk about that because I actually do have some stories regarding that. Well, let's get it. We'll get into this right okay. off the bat. You know, uh, we'll get into that and uh, then we'll get into the sea monsters here. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Stu Gerson says he loves the guru's hat. Yeah. And, you, you know, I'll tell you the reason why Ronald Murphy is such a brilliant man. He he agrees with me 100% that no one should ever eat breakfast foods for dinner. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not even that fancy French stuff. You know, if it has egg in it, it needs to be eaten before 11 o'clock in the morning. Agreed. Agreed. You know, between you and me, Guru, the yeah. some of these people eat breakfast for dinner. You know. Oh, that. I know. I've heard stories. I know. I've heard stories of pancakes and syrup for no, no, no. Well, just horrible, horrible. Is. Bacon is universal. Bacon is universal. Yeah. You know, it's like O positive or O negative blood. It's it's <laughs> universal. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said it, but chicken has egg in it. That is actually pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Look at Helena there. Y'all are crazy. Had breakfast for dinner tonight. Hey, oh. stick to the UFO. How you doing, buddy? Enjoying the suckiness of it. <laughs> 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 And Celine, that's disappointing. That's me. I'm a breakfast for dinnerer. Oh. Hmm. Mm. Yep. Brian Bowden has another new podcast starting at 1130 Pacific called I Eat Breakfast for Dinner 24 <laughs> Live from IHOP. Yep. Live from IHOP. I don't know how he does it. I don't know, man. I have no idea. I had a conversation with him on the phone the other day, and I think he was doing two podcasts while I was on the phone with him. It does not surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know he's killing himself laughing right now. Oh, absolutely. Hold on one second, Guru. Thank you, Linda, Swampy, Batmom, Murray, and Black Dragon for the amazing super chats. Here we go. Hey! 
Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Always avoiding breakfast for dinner on this end. I want to remind you that if you miss more portions of this show, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, as we are rocking it on out with the guru. And we're going to get sea monsters momentarily, but there was a question from Joe in California asking, are there any plant cryptids? Yeah, yeah, whenever I saw that question, I was so excited because whenever I was a little fella, and I'm talking about before I was even in kindergarten, my grandmother would read me this book about a somebody – it obviously was somebody in, um, I think it was it was written by a, a British fellow uh, that was um, in uh, in Africa at the turn of the uh, of the 18th century. It might be 19th century. Anyways, the, 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 the who wrote it really was meaningless, but um, he would often talk about um, legends of man-eating plants. And those were the kind of things that were really filling my mind with, you know, my imagination whenever I was a kid thinking about plants that were out there that were capable of consuming human beings. Now, I will tell you, um, so far, uh, no plants have been um, found that were capable of, uh, of uh, eating human beings. Uh, but there are some interesting tidbits that come out. Now, I, for one, am a huge um, uh, proponent of, uh, of uh, carnivorous plants. I have uh, several different varieties. I'm a big fan of the Venus flytraps. But we can get these things called pitcher plants that are quite big. So big, in fact, that um, a fairly large mouse could go into one. Um, there is a story that happened, and this is only about 10 years ago. And it's a shame that our buddy Brian Bowden is not on here because he might be able to give some input on this. But somebody was in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, and they claim whenever they were out hunting, they found something that looked very similar to a pitcher plant. Uh, that actually had a deer within it. So how these things lure their the lure animals in there is they usually put out a foul smell. Um, I was on um, an investigation one time whenever um, we came across some naturally occurring pitcher plants. And um, I thought, you know, I, I don't know what these, I, I have to find out what the big deal is. Um, so I took a smell of it and the smell was the worst smell you could possibly come up with. It smelled like rotting meat, um, but it was so bad that it actually gave me a sinus headache for about a week. So there's plants out there that are capable of doing some extraordinary things. And like I said, I have plants here that will be capable of consuming a, a large rodent. Now, in the wild, out in the middle of nowhere, is it capable that some of these plants are 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 you know, big enough to, to take down a bigger animal. Well, of course there are, of course. Um, but, but it is fascinating that there are plants out there that are indeed cryptozoological because they're unknown or undiscovered or lost to science. I want to ask you a question because there's a few researchers out there and we've talked about it. We haven't talked about this for a long time on the show who are looking into these trail cam videos, Ron, where all of a sudden, on the trail cam videos, you'll see a tree right in front of you. And then all of a sudden the tree has say moved over to its left or moved over to its right. And then in the next frame, it's right back to where it was, or sometimes the trees even vanish and then reappear. Have you ever looked into that? I did. You know what? Um, so a lot of people think that the camera has somehow moved, but I've seen enough of these things to where it appears as if, um, as if like the environment itself has changed, right? I mean, that's the way it looks to you, is right. I mean, it looks as if the the entire environment has changed and then kind of reestablished itself. Now, there's one particular area very close to where I live that I do a lot of investigations, 
where people claim that the forest moves. That's their word whenever they're out there uh, doing some walking. And I've talked to somebody who um, is actually a principal at our local school, and she and her family became lost. Now, she, she's a, a PhD um, uh, holder, uh, so she's an intelligent woman. But she and her family became lost overnight in the woods, which is probably about 10 miles away from the nearest Walmart. And she said that she went in there and the, the force itself seemed to move that she could not find her way back out again. And we're talking about not old growth forests. We're talking about, you know, this is like third or fourth growth growth forest. These, this isn't like the, uh, uh, the, 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 the redwood forests of Northern California. So I have heard this many times, Dave. And the only thing that I can say is there's enough anecdotal, um, uh, reports out there to suggest there's something going on. But I've heard reports of trees walking. Um, you know, that's actually a fairly ancient belief as well, too. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, it was believed that um, weeping willow trees could uproot themselves and they in turn would walk. I mean, there's some very ancient beliefs about this kind of stuff. Um, in, um, in Greece, it believed that oak trees were able to talk to you. Um, so, yeah, I mean... It, we um, don't really look at the world uh, with the eyes of the ancient world anymore. You know, we don't raise our own animals. Or we don't have to go out into the woods to grab firewood. Well, at least most of us don't. I do. Yeah, I know. That's what I was just saying. I'm going out this weekend. There you go. But there's an intimacy there, right? I mean, anytime you go out into the woods and you rely on the woods, there becomes this um, intimacy, this kind of exchange, this kind of norm of reciprocity. Um, we do not have a relationship with the world around us anymore. But I think that the deeper you get into that that connection between humans and the natural world, you find out that it is almost like um, interpersonal relationships. And um, I think that the, the natural world can do some amazing things. And if somebody told me that there was a tree out there was that was walking almost like the Ent in uh, in uh, the Lord of the Rings, you know, from Tolkien, um, you know, he was all he was pulling on um, um, Eastern and Western European traditions to create these kind of things. So that is part of the vernacular of the paranormal about trees uh, being able to move and switch and walk and everything else. All right, let's get to Nicole's question. She is asking, what are the guru's thoughts about different spiritual rituals being used as contact modalities for ET human experience and which works best? Now, I'm going to forewarn you, Nicole loves cooking breakfast for dinner. Oh, Nicole. Okay. Well, we should talk about the spiritual modalities that would allow you to do such things, Nicole, because at that point, uh, the idea of cooking dinner for breakfast, uh, well, Dave, you know what? If we do do a thing out in Vegas, yes. we should have, I was going to say we should have a dinner for breakfast just to show everybody, or a breakfast for dinner just to show everybody how bizarre it is. But I think what we should really do is show people, I have like a little uh, uh, conference about why not to do such things. Well, Guru, that, if we end up doing that, that's going to take a lot of alcohol. <laughs> A lot of alcohol, and I don't That's even right. drink. That's right. Well, actually, if there's any lucky ladies out there, whenever you and I are in town, they might be having some breakfast for dinner, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, <laughs> so, anyways, Nicole, so, <laughs> so what are your thoughts about spiritual rituals? Okay, so um, I am open to the, uh, to the possibility that um, we can communicate. Uh, there's a transcendency there. Um, I really don't know what extraterrestrials are. I mean, just from the, the term that they're not of this world, but I've not completely ruled that out. I think that we're dealing with something that very might possibly uh, be part of our world. Um, it's just not within our, our realm of thinking about how this kind of stuff works. Um, but I think there has to be a necessary transcendence there that we have to open our mind and allow ourselves to ascend to that particular um, plane um, where these other creatures uh, obviously are interacting at, especially if we're talking about interdimensionality. Um, but yeah, it's a very good question. It's a very complicated question. Um, you can look at, and a lot of the things I study is the role of the shaman in ancient worlds, uh, in ancient life ways. And um, what their take on the world was is that they had to enter a certain type of trance 
in order to ascend or transcend into the world of the gods or the world of, of supernatural beings. And this is something that's that's common uh, from Australia to Africa, to South America. It's common in all cultures. But the idea is that you have to enter a certain state of being and a certain mindset to allow your mind to be free, uh, to go places where it's not contained by the by the human body. So interesting. Interesting. You're getting a lot of play for that comment. You know, Chad Smith here. Welcome to Playboy Radio. <laughs> I simply meant that we would be up all night talking about the different spiritual modalities to contact extraterrestrials. Uh, obviously you did. That's, that's the way I took it. That's the way I took it. Let's get into sea monsters here. Nice. Right? Because, you know, Ron, I'm going to be honest with you. I have a deathly fear of sea monsters and uh, my and you know it, it grinds my teeth to say this but my my middle daughter is now debating whether or not she's going to join the royal canadian navy oh right which i think is great because i think i think her uh the military would would be right up her alley and you know she loves the ocean she loves uh, i don't know why you know she was out fishing off the uh off uh off of victoria the other day with with uh her boyfriend and i think he's a boyfriend i can't keep up anymore <laughs> right <laughs> and long story short uh you know i'm like hey if you see any fins man you get the hell out of there because you know megalodon lives you know so never mind just great whites and yes they do come into uh the southern part of canada here yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't like that. It just, just can't even say it properly. Ugh. Anyways, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of monsters out there that people claim to see, whether it's Ogopogo, whether it's Champ, whether it's a lot of the weird, strange creatures that are seen around uh, the Great Lakes. I mean, where do we even start with this impressive conversation? Uh, it, it's nearly impossible to start anywhere with this because uh, it's so uh, mired in mythologies from around the world. Now, I will tell you that, um, you know, the first on book that I wrote uh, was at my daughter's uh, behest, and that was on mermaids, you know. So that was kind of like the first time I I endeavored to investigate the worlds that, that exist under the waves. Um, but what was interesting is that we can find... Um, uh, rock paintings uh, dating back maybe 20,000 years ago in sub-Sahara Africa, whenever it was actually a lot closer to the ocean and it was very lush and tropical, that shows things um, very uh, similar to what we would call mermaids. It was, uh, you know, a humanoid body uh, with uh, the, 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 the lower part of the body that looked like a fish. Now, um, contemporary anthropologists and archaeologists would say they were representations of birds. You know, possibly they were. I mean, I guess you could kind of see that these were, were bird representations. But to me, from an initial look, it looks as if it's trying to depict something that's half human and half um, seagoing. Um, but so my interest in these, these kind of monsters began uh, with mermaids, because if we go back, that's probably the first kind of tell that was told. Um, you know, there was something like us that was living underneath the, the ocean. Um, but then we look at things like the Kraken, and we know that the giant squid is out there, the Architeuthis, right? Um, we know that it exists, but we've only known that it exists probably in the past decade, uh, whenever some pictures were taken and, you know, some things started to wash up on shore. Uh, but these monsters can get to uh, prodigious lengths. We know... This because we have captured blue whales that have battle marks on them from them doing, um, you know, battle with these kind of uh, creatures, you know, deep in the ocean. Um, so, yeah, where do we start? We could talk about um, the giant squid. We could talk well, about here's um, one. Megalodon. Here's one. Uh, Zune in the chat room is asking if you know anything about the Luska, which is like a half great white shark, half octopus. Yeah, the the, the shark to push from the Sci-Fi Channel. I, I, I don't, you know, I I, I don't know um, these kind of chimeras, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk about as well too tonight. Is a lot of these monsters through the through the ages um, become associated with something else 
that is extremely terrifying. So you have these monsters that are kind of mixed up uh, to uh, have a, a kind of an extra scare factor. Um, I don't think biologically that that works. I don't think that it would that, that nature would kind of select itself to have such a creature. Um, but what is amazing is the shark species that we are finding out there. You know, we know about the Greenland shark. We know about the goblin shark. And there's these really strange sharks that show up every now and then that appear more weird than the last one that was found. You know, we know the Greenland shark has, you know, probably one of the oldest living animals out there that maybe can go five or 600 years old. And we know that there's other sharks out there that are, you know, existed from the fossil record uh, that is still uh, uh, moping around. But um, the megalodon is, is really one of my favorite kind of, uh, of, of sea creatures. Uh, because whenever I was a kid, originally they were supposed to be as long as a school bus and four or five people could stand up upright within their jaws. Um, now that has actually been um, kind of questioned by science, that it might have had this huge, huge mouth, but they may not have been these, this bulky kind of um, uh, uh, creature. They might have been more streamlined and much more uh, shaped like a great white shark uh, so they could attack, you know, very, very swiftly. Um, if that is the case, I would say that it's possible uh, that the uh, the megalodon could still be out there someplace, uh, and I think a lot of people in your chat room would say the same. Um, I know that we are finding a lot of uh, of megalodon teeth, especially in places like um, uh, New Jersey, for whatever reason. Um, and now, of course, these are fossilized teeth, uh, but you know, I would think that more people that are out there beach going and, and peach, uh, beach combing and everything. It might be interesting if one day uh, they pull out of the sand a, a uh, megalodon tooth that was fresh. Now, that would not be great. I'm hoping something like that happens someday. But for the megalodon to exist, they would have to be in the, the extremely open oceans uh, where nobody would come in contact with them. Um, and unlike the movie The Meg, um, although Brian Bowden and I did have the uh, the uh, the author of the book Meg on our show a few years ago, a very intelligent human being, um, but he uh, proposed that um, these kind of megalodons, if they do exist, would uh, live in the deep uh, abysmal region of the ocean, you know, where light doesn't trickle down. Um, I don't think that is, in fact, the case. I, I think that one of the reasons these creatures would not be seen is because they would be avoiding, you know, any kind of uh, contact with, um, you know, our ships and such, because all these kind of things that human beings put out in the water have a particular sonar signature to them, and that can irritate things. So they probably try to avoid us as much as possible. But I think these creatures will be in the very open, deep ocean. And um, I think that sooner or later, if one of these things are out there, we are going to cross paths with it. Well, there is rumor that there is a super shark out there. Uh -huh. Bigger than a great white, smaller than a megalodon that grows between 30, 25 and 35 feet long. And they believe that this is a, a new hybrid species of what is going on in the oceans because there's a lot more weird, strange attacks that are happening on these creatures and and on whales and wow. and other uh sorts that that lead to the fact that there is a larger shark up out there that is more aggressive mm -hmm. you know could could we be seeing these popping up soon i think so now the, let's let's look at this for a, a bit and, and and this is a very interesting uh, point that you made so we people have reported seeing great white sharks that were bitten in half. We're talking about a great white shark that is the size of an apex predator out there, right? We're talking about a 20-foot great white shark that is nearly bitten in half by another animal, right? That's some scary stuff. Uh, there was also research done on a shark that had a tracking device in it. I don't know if, if you ever went over this on your show or not, um, but all of a sudden, as they were tracking this shark, uh, the temperature changed. It got much, much warmer and then the tracking signal took a very abrupt dive deep down into the ocean. And it's uh, the assumption is something grabbed this shark. That's why the, 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 the temperature changed on the, on the, uh, the, the uh, device. And then the, the, uh, the depth dropped because it was taking it down in the deep ocean to feed upon it. That's scary stuff. I mean, and we know that this actually happened. We don't know what caused it, but we know that it did happen. 
So a couple things could be happening here about this, these super sharks. Um, from um, an adaptation point of view, uh, it's very probable that the world's oceans would not sustain a shark the size of Megalodon, though so through natural selection over the past, you know, you know, 100,000, 200,000 years, they simply downsized, which is an extreme possibility. Or the other point that you made, uh, due to cl uh, global uh, climate change, that two um, very unlike sharks that don't encounter each other very often uh, now are forced to intermingle with each other and have interbred to create a new species of shark, which is also very probable. And we know these kind of things happen because there are now hybrids of the grizzly bear and the polar bear, which is very rarely, if ever, seen. But because of global warming, the um, the, uh, the 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 ecosystems of these animals are now overlapping where one time they never did. So we are now seeing these very supersized bear. Some of these bears are so large that a polar bear, now, of course, you know, these things can stand 12 feet tall. These are huge, huge animals. Some of these skulls are being found, these, these super bears, that a polar bear skull could fit inside of the mouth of these super bears. So there's strange things going on out there. Does the mating kind of happen? Like, okay, if we have, say, a six foot eight tall man and a six foot two woman, the chances or the genes that their children have will be that those children should be very tall, if right. not taller. Do you think this is what's happened in the oceanic community where maybe you get a, a, 18 foot great white male, the females are bigger. You know, you get a 20 foot great white female that could learn to create a larger shark. Mm -hmm. Could sure. it work the same way? Yeah. I mean, there, what would happen if we have a great white shark and a tiger shark? Or what happens if we have a great white shark and maybe another species of shark we haven't even classified yet coming together? Um, these are all extremely possible things to happen. Um, it all it all really comes down to the fact of um, what kind of species are interlapping at a particular place at a particular time. But the idea of, of a great white shark and a uh, and a tiger shark is something that's always fascinated me. Let's go into the Great Lakes here because the Great Lakes, as we will continue this chat next hour. All right, the Great Lakes have a lot of mysteries a lot of First Nations mysteries, a lot of legends, a lot of folklore, a lot of people believe there's portals that allow mm -hmm. these monsters and these UFOs to come in over there. I mean, everybody knows the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Witch of November. I mean, sea monsters have been seen in the lakes, especially Lake Superior. Uh, and they're a creepy place, man. They're a creepy, creepy place. And and I want to get into what you've learned about these mount these monsters out there because if you know, I still think there's a major book there for sea monsters of the Great Lakes, man. We got about 20 seconds. Yeah, um, well, I'll give you a little bit of uh, of, of hint about it. So I was doing a conference up in uh, Sault Ste. Marie uh, in Michigan, but I never really gave lake monsters much of a thought. Um, and there, we, the the conference was actually held on a Native American. Uh, uh, Indian Reservation, the Ojibwa. And it was from me talking uh, to those very beautiful people and hearing their stories about lake monsters that uh, that prompted me to write my book on the monsters of the Great Lakes. So we'll have to talk all about that. For sure. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, an encyclopedia of cryptid information from North America and around the world. You can go on Amazon, find any of his books at Ronald L. Murphy Jr. We'll be back with the second hour of Spaced Out Radio and the Guru right after this. All right, we're clear. All right, all right. Let me see what people are saying here. Boy, your people are really on. Oh, yeah. 
<clears throat> oh, yeah. Yum and press. Yeah, they're pretty brilliant, man. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bob Birkins called something a king shark. You know what? I like the idea of that, Bob. I don't I don't know where Bob is from, but I think that that is... He's see, from Quebec. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I will have to applaud him on that. I like that term very much, that, you know, two shark species that uh, if they this is indeed the case, they are uh, interbreeding. I think uh, the name uh, king shark is very appropriate. That would be a good one. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Cat wants to know when are you selling your hats, Guru? Autograph. <laughs> in uh, in Vegas. No way, man. I'm taking. I'm stealing that hat. There's more, <laughs> there's more than one. Yeah, I'm stealing that badass because that's at least a size eight. You got a good it size. Is it is eight. It's yeah. that you're right on the bottom. Yep. Yeah. See, that'll fit me. Yes. That would fit me. Lori Oliphant, how are you? Welcome to the show. Yes, uh, the fake Robert Salas. Just want to say great show. Hope to be on soon. You, you got too many S's on your name to be the real Robert Salas, just so you know. Right. And uh, what else we got here? God, I hate sea monsters, man. Hate them. Yeah, sea monsters are scary, man. I, I love the ocean, but I'm actually yeah. very afraid of the ocean as well. Oh, man. Tell me about it. Hey, thank you, GF, 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 GFG, for that awesome super chat. Really appreciate that. And uh, thank you for your love and support of this show, man. Thank you. That's awesome. <clears throat> uh, we're going to do a little bit more Sea Monsters, GFG. Uh, then I will get to your question uh, right after that. Uh, I've swam in two lakes that have sea monsters in them. And now thinking about it, that was just dumb. Uh, what happened to the moose oil? My beard. I trim my beard. I don't moose oil when my beard is this small. <clears throat> uh, any reports of earthquakes in Newfoundland tonight? I haven't checked. I haven't checked. There's a new podcast for Brian, Earthquake Central with Brian Bowden. <laughs> I don't know how he does it, man. I don't know how he does it. He's on the he's on the scene now. He's on the scene too. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. The boat the Bowden copter gets him everywhere <laughs> he needs to go. He already has an ID around his neck and everything like oh, that. Oh yeah. Absolutely he does. <clears throat> hey dirty filth, how you doing? How you feeling, buddy? Give me a thumbs up if you're doing okay. Dirty, dirty filth. What's with you? <laughs> yeah, Kira, Dave hates the ocean. Hates the ocean. It's nice in pictures. It's beautiful in pictures. But you know what? Behind every beautiful wave, there is a shark willing to eat you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Crunch time. How you doing, buddy? Joshua S., good to see you. Sir Bryden Bowden, the Bowden Copter en route. Thanks, there it Brian. Is. Thanks, Brian, for that awesome super chat, buddy. We love you, man. He's such a good dude. He is. we got to come on sometime together, too. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. He's always so busy, though. Remember, he, he blew us off last time. You know, the last time I was supposed to be on, or the last time I came on the show, he was supposed to be on here with me. But I, I, if I can remember correctly, he blew us both off. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's because he was starting eight new podcasts. That's right. That's right. He didn't have time for us anymore. No, nope. no. Nope. Hi, Shar. How are you? Good to see you. We got about uh, 45 seconds here, buddy. Akira loves the ocean. I, I love the ocean too, Kira. Kira also eats breakfast for dinner. So, uh, you know, some things you have to overlook. Uh, no. I think I could probably overlook that. No, no, no. I'm not overlooking that. Sorry. Uh, all right. A big thank you to Brian, GFG, GFG, Linda, Swampy, Bat Mom, Murray, and Black Dragon for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support this show, what we do here each and every night on the show. A uh, big thank you to all the veterans tuning in. We absolutely love you. You always have a home here on Spaced Out Radio. And to all our regulars, much love in the chat room. Here we go with Hour 2 and the Guru. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio at KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to YouTube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do me the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club sang freud sang freud is your password use it wisely space travelers as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on spaced out radio our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is here talking sea monsters and monsters all night long as the guru is a fan favorite of all of our listeners. Here are some of our highest rated shows, and you can find all of his books on Amazon. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., Guru, welcome back. Hey, thanks a lot, Dave. And we are blowing through this, my friend. Already 107 in the AM. I know. It is it is busy, busy, busy here. It is nonstop. Yeah. Just question after question. This is great. That's why we love our guru time, my friend. Hey, sea monsters, mm -hmm. Great Lakes. What's going on over there? Why is it so weird? Oh, well, what is so cool about the Great Lakes, uh, and uh, these are all glacial lakes, and what is so cool about that is that at the same time the Great Lakes were created is the same time the uh, the Lake Champlain was created and the same time that Loch Ness was created. So something was going on in that very specific geological period to allow very strange things to happen. Um, from you know the very beginning, Water has always been seen mystical. It always been seen as either a conduit to the other world or a way to the underworld. So in our imaginations, in our human imaginations, uh, water has always been seen as a gateway or a doorway. So what's unique about these bodies of water, like Champlain, Lake, Lake Champlain or Lake Loch Ness, is that they're occurring in places that really um, shouldn't, these kind of waterways shouldn't be there. Um, Loch Ness is in the highlands of Scotland, very, very unusual. And Lake Champlain is this massive lake tucked away there in up, you know, upstate New York on the Canadian border. Now, the Great Lakes is something that is entirely different. Um, actually, the Great Lakes is kind of a misnomer because it should really be called an inland sea because they are all connected in some way or the other. Um, the, the other thing is that places like Lake Michigan and Lake uh, Superior in particular is that these are not typical lake environments. Uh, these are environments where you would be more closely seeing um, ocean type of things happening. Uh, storms rage uh, very wild there. We have unbelievable surf in those areas. And we have a great diversity of animal life. Also, these lakes are very deep, which a lot of people don't understand either. Um, so with all that being said, 
uh, doorway to an under the other world, and these these this massive amount of water in very unusual places that is all added a little bit to the mystery. Now, the other thing about these Great Lakes is that they were, whenever I talk about the last glaciers retreating, we're only talking about 14,000 years ago, which in the blink of an eye, you know, it, it, it's a second in geological time. Um, in my one book on lake monsters that I wrote, um, I, I, you know, I posited that, you know, if um, whenever the Paleo Indians were here, whenever they had migrated over, they were already here for, a, you know, a few thousand years before the Great Lakes were formed. And they could have visually watched the lakes filling up. Um, and I think a lot of our flood stories from around the world um, occurred during this time, whenever the glaciers were retreating and, you know, ocean water was spilling in. I think that we can probably pinpoint a lot of our um, our flood motifs back to about 14,000 years ago, and I'd be very comfortable in saying that. So not only were they able to watch these things fill up, but it also created a new environment for them, you know, something new there. Now, one of my beliefs is this, and, um, you know, it could be complete conjecture or whatever, but, but this is one of my beliefs. Um, over in England, especially around the Devon area, um, one of the greatest finds of oceanic fossils uh, is on that particular beach. Uh, the first uh, plesiosaur that was identified was found on that beach. So is it possible that the waters around uh, England uh, during the uh, last ice age could have been the home for at least a remnant population of aquatic reptiles? You know, is it possible? Um, now, if it is possible, if we only even had a remnant population of aquatic reptiles at that time, is it possible that whenever the, the Great Lakes or whenever the uh, glaciers receded and it opened up these channels into places to form Lake Loch Ness, some of these creatures then went into them? Um, that could indeed be where the idea, at least the idea, the myth of the Loch Ness Monster came from. And through folklore and through tradition, it was told and retold to the point that we still believe that there's a, a plesiosaur-like animal in Loch Ness. Or is it possible that they did indeed enter Loch Ness and it was sealed off and at least you had a small population there? Um, I, again, like I said, this is all speculation and conjecture, but it makes some sort of sense about where these things came from. Now, whenever we talk about the, uh, the Great Lakes, that's a whole entirely different story. We're talking about a massive amount of water. Uh, actually, if you would empty all the Great Lakes, um, all of North America would be up about ankle deep. It, it, that's a lot of water uh, to take from that, from that area. Um, and the First Nations have so many tells about creatures that live in there. Uh, the the Meshapishu is one of the ones that they tell about this great water lynx or water panther that inhabits um, uh, Lake Superior. And uh, so there is not only these kind of folklore uh, things that come out, but also people have witnessed things there as well, too. Uh, you know, Lake Champlain has a plethora of uh, sightings year after year. Right. And uh, even in uh, Lake uh, Michigan, uh, back in 1955, there was a report of a child being attacked by a shark. Uh, and it's very possible the shark could enter Lake Michigan, especially a bull shark, uh, by going up the Mississippi River. So let us just say that these great lakes here in North America are so unbelievably mysterious that even in the 21st century, people were still th seeing things that should not be there. But, you know, even reports up to today, uh -huh. we're seeing dinosaur, dragon-like creatures that are swimming through the water with, with spikes on their backs, with, you know, some claiming to have wings on their backs, especially in the Great Lakes. I mean, we're seeing, like, stuff that was drawn up in, in 1500s folklore here. That's right. Yeah, so when the one you're talking about, that's absolutely the case. At the beginning of the show, you know, I touched a little bit on um, uh, the Chupacabra. And if you look at the Mishapishu uh, up there in uh, Lake Superior, it's almost a carbon copy of what the original um, 
uh, uh, Chupacabra was said to look like. A very stout little body. Sometimes it has a long serpentine towel. Sometimes it doesn't. But it has these stereotypical, almost iconic spikes all over its body. Um, sometimes it even has the ability to fly, which leads some people to think that this creature could also be some sort of remnant uh, memory of uh, UFO activity in that area as well, too. Um, but whatever is going on, like I said, it's embedded within the oral tradition of the Native Americans up there. And that is something that I pay a lot of attention to because these people have intrinsically been tied to this land for, you know, at least 14, 15,000 years. And, you know, we do not know how far these traditions go back. It's very possible that they're telling and retelling stories that have been there since the very beginnings, the genesis of the Great Lakes themselves. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Okay. Yeah. So when we look at, say, the, the monsters of, of Lake Superior or Lake Huron or or even going into Lake Ontario and Lake Michigan and Erie, do we look at, you know, these creatures as the same as what we are seeing in Lake Champlain or Okanagan Lake where Ogopogo is? You can. I see that is the thing. Um, I tend to see, think that these are uh, the same, whatever they may be. I, I, again, going back to, to my to my at least my speculation is that whenever these Great Lakes opened up, when these lakes opened up and allowed salt water to go in, um, there may possibly have been sea life that we thought was extinct entering these kind of openings. Um, we know in Vermont, uh, up in Lake Champlain, we know that at least a few wells entered that lake because the St. Fossil of Vermont is a well that was discovered on the banks of Lake Champlain. It was like a beluga well. So we do know that these kind of big creatures got into this area. Is it possible that something that fed upon these wells followed them in? Well, absolutely it is. We do not know what the world was like 14,000 years ago. We have no idea what kind of creatures may still have been out there. And um, it's very possible they, these creatures, like, like I said, and I'm not saying it was a plesiosaur, but it could have been some sort of extinct reptile, very much like the plesiosaur that through, you know, um, uh, natural selection and evolution had, had become a different animal altogether. But it's very possible they were still looking in the very shallow waters right off the coasts of North America and England. Um, and whenever the ocean, op you know, whenever these gateways opened up and the ocean ran in, that they either were swept in or they followed prey animals in there. It's a whole new environment. And by these creatures entering that environment, they now become the apex predators and in control of that environment. Extremely possible, my friend. All right, let's get to a question here from GF, 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 G. Have you had any banshee stories? She shrieks as a forewarning for family members' death. Also, Ron, are you aware of the Abhartok, an Irish vampire legend that inspired Bram Stoker's Dracula? Let's start with the banshees. All right, yes. Yeah, so banshees, and I do have banshee stories on my in my On Fairies book as well, because the word banshee, uh, the she, actually, the S-H-E-E, -E, uh, means fairy. And the band part is female. So it's a female uh, fairy. Um, so, And these are creatures, because they're fairies, that they straddle the two worlds at once, which means that they have knowledge of, of what this world offers to us. Um, that is the unique thing about uh, fairies and the unique thing about ghosts that a lot of people have tended, tended to forget is that whenever ghosts were was, was part of the the of the oral tradition and the ancient tradition um, in, in in Europe, that they were able to bring knowledge of um, the other world into our world. So whenever they were, uh, uh, you know, the ominous uh, premonitions of death, that's where they would get it from, is because they were from a different world and time is not linear. So they kind of know all things at all times. But absolutely. Um, Sometimes they would scream out a person's name. Uh, sometimes people would see a banshee at a creek 
washing the clothes of somebody that was going to be dying too. So I've heard stories about uh, there will be a, a haggard woman uh, standing over a, a, a creek and she was trying to scrub the blood out of this one particular person's um, uh, surcoat and that person was still alive. So that was kind of like uh, the precursor to what was going to happen. But um, yeah, of course. So Banshees, um, if you want to read more about them, like I said, my, my book on fairies has a whole uh, a section on there. Now, the thing about um, vampires and uh, the Dracula legend, and I'll go even one better here. So Bram Stoker was a sickly boy, um, and he spent a lot of his formative years actually laid up in bed, you know, his, his proverbial sick bed, if you will. And outside of his window in Ireland was a graveyard. Uh, so he got to see, you know, graves all of his life. And he also had this fascination and this pre, you know, the, the, you know, he was always thinking about his own health. So he has this kind of relationship with the dead already. But he was also a very intelligent man as well. There is a, a particular fairy that occupies the wilds of, Aus of, uh, of Ireland. Uh, not only are they part of the land itself, but they also have a castle there which is extremely reminiscent of the whole vampire mythos. But that fairy's name, of course, it's in Gaelic, and I, I can't begin to pronounce it, but it's two words. Uh, the first syllable of that word is pronounced something like drac or drock, and then the last part of that, the last syllable is eula. So you come Dracula uh, from that. Um, so whenever we talk about um, uh, Vlad the Impaler, uh, uh, you know, the Dracul uh, from Romania as being the uh, the precursor or the uh, the uh, the you know, the uh, idea, the figurehead for this particular work uh, by Bram Stoker. Uh, it may not be all on that particular person. I think he's pulling from Irish folklore as well that has a very deep um, uh, idea and belief system in um, these creatures that were also um, uh, consume human blood. Oh, that sounds just creepy. Yeah. Creepy. Well, these, these Dracula fairies would uh, lay... So, Ireland, there's a lot of desolate area in, in Ireland, the same way within Scotland. Uh, we think that everything is built up. So, there's a lot of desolate area. So, these particular fairies would lay out along, like, the one road... That would go through a particular moorland and they would wait for an unsuspecting traveler to come by and then they would of course grab them and feed upon them and everything um these are very you know morbid type of tales but we can find these in traditions around the world which makes me believe that there is some sort of truth to these things all right let's get to carrie ann's question she is asking are there any monster clams I wow, yeah, you know what? I never thought about that. I think one of the reasons why people um, don't associate uh, monster clams uh, with uh, something that's you know frightening is because they can't you know move around as readily. Um, I, I seem to remember a story whenever I was a kid about a diver, I think it was off the coast of California, that almost got trapped within a giant clam. I, I, I don't have any more specifics than that, but um. I'm interested why that person asked that question um, because I've never had anybody ask me a question about a clam before. Well, why not? I mean, could you imagine being trapped or like that diver earlier this year off of uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, who accidentally got scooped up by a humpback whale? Yes, yes, well, yes, well, yes. Well, what the hell is he doing diving for lobsters when there's great whites all over that area? Well, yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. When you're, in, when you're in Provincetown, and I've only been there once, if you're walking along the ocean, there are giant signs saying these waters are patrolled by great whites. Do not go swimming in them. Yep. Yeah. You know, that, that's well, enough see, warning for me, man. That's right. See, I, I think a lot of our listeners um, and a lot of people, whenever I go uh, do talks, they don't understand that the oceans you find in like Atlantic City and Myrtle Beach and Virginia Beach are far different than other beaches around the world. OK, we have we have um, vacation places, 
But there are some places where the beaches and the waters are very, very wild and untamed. And those places are the things that scare me, but these are also the places that I'm drawn to the most. I'm drawn to the places like in northern Maine and up into the uh, Maritimes of, of Canada, where people actually work to make a living out of the ocean, and nobody is going up onto the shores with uh, sun hats on and sunglasses and sunbathing. You know, these are waters that are still wild. And, uh, and as, as an investigator, I always look out into those waters and wonder what is patrolling underneath the surface of those waters. I don't want to know. But you, you do want to know. But the thing is, though, if you had knowledge of knowing, then you don't want to be around it at all. Do you know what I mean? Like, water is a mystery. Like, we probably know more about the surface of the moon than we know about our oceans. Um, we have almost everything mapped. But there's still so many mysteries about what's going on. We really don't know what the deepest part of the ocean is yet. Uh, one of your uh, uh, listeners had remarked about the possibility of being like this ocean within an ocean. Uh, that that apparently is absolutely true. You know that there's this um, uh, uh, this particular volume of water that has a different density than the water around it. So we don't even know what kind of life forms might live within that ocean uh, that's under the ocean itself. Um, and then um, the idea of things that can leave that water, uh, such as the bull shark, and enter into fresh water. And that's a whole new ball game at this point to think that there's things out there in the oceans that now can enter into our relatively safe world. You know, that's what happened uh, with uh, back in 1916 with uh, in uh, New Jersey which uh, spurred the uh, book of Jaws along whenever some sort of shark came into the freshwater river and, uh, you know, killed a few people. Oh, two minutes left. A, a Ron wants to know, what's your thoughts on sirens of the ocean? Right. Um, well, not only in the ocean, uh, we actually have a lot of uh, uh, traditions of, uh, of mermaids and sirens in rivers as well. Um, not only in Africa, but uh, I live in Pennsylvania and the Schuylkill River has actually had one report of a mermaid sighting in it. That's an absolutely true uh, true story. Um, I've also heard somebody tell me a report that they are, are completely serious whenever they told me that they had a mermaid sighting in a man-made lake outside of Reno, Nevada. Now, if that is the case, then we must be talking about something that is uh, occurring within the water itself. Uh, and that's whenever you come up with the, this idea of the elemental, uh, which uh, the great uh, alchemist uh, Paracelsus believed that mermaids were, that they were an intelligence that inhabited the water itself. So they were um, kind of like, uh, you know, the, the 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 spirit that inhabited that particular water. Uh, again, that's another rabbit hole we can go down to. But um, as of, uh, you know, the early 2000s, uh, there was um, uh, witch doctors that had to be called out in Africa to um, to exercise the uh, mermaids out of a particular river because they said well, they were attacking the construction workers of a dam there. Quickly from Nicola, 40 seconds. Uh, Nicola lives in upstate New York. Have you ever heard of any lake monsters in the Finger Lakes? No, I have not. I have not heard. Now, remember, the Finger Lakes are made at the exact same time. Uh, these are all uh, uh, scoured out by the, the, the glacial uh, uh, retreat. Um, but I'm not sure how deep the, uh, the Finger Lakes are. And the other unique thing about the Finger Lakes is that they do not have a direct connection to the ocean in any way. Um, so I think that might be one of the reasons why we don't have that same kind of uh, um, mystique to them as these other lakes do. Guru, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Halfway through Spaced Out Radio tonight, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. We got him for another hour here. We're going to continue your monster talk with your questions. If you're in one of our chat rooms or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. You can find all of his books on Amazon, including his On series. We call him the guru around here, and the guru speaketh right after this break on Spaced Out Radio. All right, guru, we're clear. 
All righty, all righty. It's going well, my friend. It is. You know, it really is. We're having a good night here. Uh, hey, Major Lee, how you doing? Uh, Max Hawthorne. Max Hawthorne is the guy we had on talking about Megalodon and this Super Shark. All right. Excaliperful, Pikachu, good to see you. What was that? Dave Scott's voice can bust at my eardrums, man. Sorry about that. Peppa H, how you doing, buddy? <coughs> it's good times, Guru. Yes, it is. Good times. You got any conferences coming up? I don't, man. Uh, you know, Mothman was canceled. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's just one of those really weird things. I've had a few conferences. I'll be up at Hillview Manor uh, next month and then the month after that. But uh, I'm just doing, like, little things. All the big stuff has pretty much been canceled. Right on. That's why we have to wait until next year. That sucks, man. It does. <laughs> I love reading these things. I really do. Sir Brian weighing in, we need an SOR conference. I do I do agree that we... I, I like your idea... But I do like the idea as well as having a, a real conference with that. You and Brian need to start up a guru con. <laughs> guru con. That is totally what is needed is guru con. I've been talking to um, Kat uh, about uh, something like that as well. So not, not a guru con. I, I appreciate that. But I, I was talking to Kat about having some sort of uh, conference uh, going on. I would love to see a conference being held at a university. I really would. Um, I think that if you get enough intelligent uh, guests lined up that can talk about this, you know, um, from an academic point of view, enough so it doesn't seem like there's too much woo. Although you got to have a little bit of woo there. Um, I, I think that, that would break down a few borders that are still standing. Right. Right. That would be cool, man. It would. That would be so cool. Cat uh, Ward, thank you so much for the amazing super chat. G West, thank you for the amazing super chat as well. Really do appreciate the love and support, man. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, Sasquatch, how you doing? Good to have you back. Robert Moore, good to see you, my friend. And who else has uh, come on in here? Um, we're good right now. We are good right now. We got uh, about 90 seconds, brother. We're running. Mm -hmm. B. Hoff, good to have you here, Flat Earther. That beard is looking gorgeous tonight. <laughs> I've got a little bit of white in it, too, a little bit of uh, salt in it, you know. Oh, yeah, that looks that looks uh, healthy. Nah. It's healthy. Hey, Kevin's beard is back. Look at that. Kevin's beard from Texas. Got to love Kevin's beard. How you doing, my friend? How's the hog hunting going? Give me an update. We got one minute, Guru. All right. <clears throat> I don't know. Vinny is on a break again. I don't know where the hell he is. Where's Fap tonight, too? All right. Big thank you to Black Dragon, Murray, Bat Mom, Swampy, Linda, GFGFGFGFG, GF, 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 Brian, Kira, Cat, and G West for the amazing super chats tonight. 
We really love and appreciate the support of SOR. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our regulars who are here tuning us in right now, like Gorgeous Adventures with Beth. Good to see you. And uh, we love you all. Thank you so much for making this show so much fun. Hi, Ross Lambda. And, of course, to all the veterans out there, we always make sure you have a safe home here with Spaced Out Radio. We love you, and thank you so much for all of your services. We appreciate it. We're going to get going with the guru here in three seconds. Stay tuned. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you've seen or heard most of this show, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. All of his books can be found on Amazon, so make sure you check it on out. You definitely want to grab his on series. He's an award-winning author as well. Guru, we're going to start with a question from RB here in the chat room. What is your thoughts about Mothman? I grew up a couple of hours from there. Yeah, you know, I've only been to Point Pleasant one time, and that was a few years ago uh, to speak at the conference. Um, interesting place. Uh, now, another thing that we haven't talked about today uh, is the possibility that some of these creatures are not only, you know, tulpas we talked about, but what happens if they are creations from our own um, uh, uh, inventions, so to speak? So we know that there's a TNT plant there, um, but there also are rumors that nuclear waste was stored in that area as well. So is it possible that some of these things that we call cryptids might be mutations of, of otherwise uh, readily known uh, and identified animals? Uh, as of late, a lot of people have been proposing that the the, uh, the Mothman has been nothing more than a sandhill crane. Um, and that's really almost a definitive belief now whenever we, we talk about science that uh, there was, you know, this was on the, the, the migration pattern of Sandhill cranes. Uh, somebody saw one and then the uh, t- telephone game uh, began. And by the time it, you know, went down the wire, it became some sort of, you know, flying cryptid with big red glowing eyes. Um, I think there might be more to it than that than it meets the eye. Um I think uh, the Mothman is some uh, again uniquely American. If you look at it from that perspective, but if you look at it from a more worldview, we have creatures like uh, the Lamassu in Greek culture. We have the Owlman in Celtic cal- uh, culture of like Cornwall. So we have these ideas that there are flying humanoids out there with these kind of red glowing eyes that every now and then interact with humanity. Um, and I am of the uh, of the opinion that the Mothman resides in the same realm as the Owlman and these other kind of creatures that, you know, for lack of a better word, have been, have been identified as demons throughout the years. They come from some sort of place uh, within our world that uh, every now and then, again, I use the term, seeps into our world, whether we're talking about interdimensionality, whether we talk about portals or what have you, but somehow they're able to leave their world and enter into our world. Hmm. Are there those two different worlds, though? Yeah. See, the way I look at it is this. I look at reality as almost like an onion, okay? So you can take off a layer and you can see through that layer. It's you know it's pretty translucent, um, but the deeper you go, the less it, you can't see the whole way through. So you can see a little bit of everything fuzzy through the first layer, and it gets a little bit more cloudy as you go down. And I think that that's really the way reality is. I think that we're all layered one up on top of another, and uh, every now and then those layers kind of fade into each other. All right, let's go to TFV. 
who is asking, do you think the government has engineered a lookalike cryptid copied, say, a Bigfoot or a rake? Uh, I don't think there's been any engineering going on, but I am quite positive, almost 100% positive, 98% positive, that our government knows about these kind of creatures uh, far more than they're letting on. Um, you know, last time I was on the show, I talked about um, this field manual the U.S. Army put out that uh, um, uh, discussed the possibilities of um, a, a Sasquatch living in Northern California. And then if uh, the soldiers that were training up there encountered that particular sort of wildlife, what to do and what not to do. So I think the military and I think the government does know about these things. But as far as this engineering goes, I don't think that's going on. All right, Jennifer is asking, have you ever heard of rawhide and bloody bones? My aunt used to scare me with that story. Anything to it, what could it be? Jennifer, that would make the perfect name for a cowboy bar. I do not know anything about rawhide and bloody bones. I This must be something very colloquial. Um, I don't know where Jennifer Hawkins is from. Uh, but I we need to hear more about this story, Dave. Dave, she needs a she can't leave us hanging. Well, we'll see what she puts in the yeah. in the uh, chat room to uh, fire yeah. us up about this one. That one just kind of, you know, scares me just looking uh, at it. Yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking, I'm wondering if this has almost like um, uh, the 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 Wendigo type of feel. I was just going to say that Wendigo, shifter, yeah, Wendigo and uh, and uh, Skinwalker type of creatures. That's what it almost seems like. That's what it seems like to me too. Yeah, you know. I mean, do you have any updates or any new stories on the Windigo or, or, uh, no, no, but they, there is a lake. I think it's in, uh, Northern Wisconsin called Lake Windigo. I need to get there so badly. Um, the part of the folklore is that the spirit of a Windigo actually inhabits that lake. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, folklore and uh, urban legends going around that if you wait there, you can hear the things screaming at you or talking to you. But I know on, um, on, on YouTube and on social media, because I do a lot of research on there to see what is kind of, kind of have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in the paranormal world. And right now the Skinwalker and the Wendigo is huge. And you can find a lot of um, uh, footage on there of people claiming they can hear something calling out to them, something screaming out to them, whether it's their name or somebody yelling for help out in the middle of nowhere. Interesting. Mm. There's nothing freaky about that. You know what? I'm the first time I I started to watch these shows, uh, the, these these reports. I, I said the same thing. I said, "There's really." No, I mean, I was honest. I said, "There's nothing freaky about that." But then they were showing out like they were like 30 miles from the nearest road, and they were riding their horse, and the horse was kind of acting a little bit jittery, and then it would come to a dead stop, and somebody would say hello or help or call the person's name out. That's terrifying. You know, that's absolutely terrifying. I love this question by Jenny. How about cryptid pigs? Yep, absolutely. You know, uh, there was a gentleman that took a, 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 a wild hog. I believe that was in Texas that I think they said it weighed somewhere around Oh, come my hunters out there, you'll have to let me know. I'm thinking like this hogzilla is what they called it, was something around 1,200 pounds. I mean, it, it was a massive animal. It was almost like, you know, um, uh, uh, Pleistocene type of, of, of big megafauna. Um, and pigs can get very big. Um, and a lot of the pigs that are running rampant uh, in the south of, uh, of America uh, is um, they're, um, they're feral farm animals. Uh, that have, uh, you know, resorted to a more uh, 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 wild behavior. Uh, and sometimes there's interbreeding going on as well. But um, we know that our farm pigs can get very, very big. I think that's probably what happened is they somebody shot a, uh, a, um, uh, a farm animal that had escaped. But, yeah, there, there are definitely reports of big, giant hogs out there. Um, one of the uh, best places to look at hog stories um, about these kind of creatures terrorizing people is in Australia of all places because they have quite a hog problem there as well. 
Well, everything kills you in Australia. Everything absolutely kills you in Australia. There is nothing there that wants to give you a hug. Even the cutest things that they have there. Like, I would love to reach down into a creek over there and pick up a platypus and give it a hug. But do you know what it would do? It would take that little poisonous spur of it, and it would scratch my eyes out, and it would poison yep. me. Who yep. does that? Who does that? Yep. Or, you know, I would love to grab a koala bear up and, you know, rub its nose, but it's going to kill me. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I'm surprised that anybody lives past the age of 35 in Australia. Absolutely. I'm very surprised by that, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. I mean, you can't swim in the ocean because nope. everything there wants to kill you. You can't go on the land because everything there wants to kill you. You can't swim in your own backyard pool because you got crocodiles. Yeah. yeah. Okay? You can't swim anywhere. That's right. Yeah. Horrible place. People getting the poisonous snakes out of their bathrooms. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, you, can't even, you can't even take a, a a good bathroom break, sit down and take a good bathroom break without a poisonous snake slithering up the toilet plumbing. It, you know what exactly, I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. Can't do but it. I, I, you know what? I would love to visit that place, but now that I'm now that we're talking about this more, I don't think that's going to happen. No, no, not no. me, man. Not me. All right, let's get to alien critter. Guru, do you believe that most paranormal activity can be explained by science? Um, I don't think that it can be explained by science, but I think that it should be considered by science. Uh, I think there should be documentation being used. I think the scientific method should be employed because in order for us to be accepted uh, by the mainstream, we need to have some sort of proof or some sort of documentation. So that is my kind of way of thinking about that. I think that we should have more of a, um, of a uh, relationship uh, with a scientific community. And I think the scientific community, and I'm not talking just about, you know, physics and, and, and things like that, but I'm talking also about psychology and sociology, um, the kind of humanities, they should have, um, uh, some sort of open dialogue with us as well, too, because there is this all this information out there that is that is being unprocessed about why people see the things they do and what happens whenever people encounter these types of things. By the way, Ozzy Ange says, guys, relax. I'm in my 50s. I'm alive. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. Wow. I'll yeah. tell you. Okay. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I've seen Ange's pictures. On Instagram, there is no way she's in her fifties. Right, no Same. way she's in her fifties. I, I'm calling serious uh, uh, shenanigans on that one. Right. So she's either lying to us. Well, she has to be lying to us, and I'll tell you why she's lying to us. Because even their football over there, they play football without any kind of protection whatsoever. Right. They're trying to kill each other. We're trying to kill each other. Exactly. Even even people over there want to kill other people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, dangerous place at Australia. It is. Yeah. All right. Race fan is asking, have you heard of any lake monsters in Washington State? Uh, you know what? I'm sure that I probably have. Uh, and I will be quite honest. The Pacific Northwest is one of those places that I have to go explore, but I've never been there. So I'm going to have to um, to uh, um, be honest and say that I'm ignorant on that matter. But hopefully one day I'll be able to get up some investigations up there. All right. Uh, Nicola is asking, Guru, are there any colleges that have cryptozoology courses? Zero. Now, I will tell you this. Occasionally, occasionally, you will have a college that will offer a cryptozoology course as an elective. But there is no colleges that will uh, grant you a degree in cryptozoology. Um, so what you have to do is you have to kind of go about it your own way. Um now, my daughter is in a, um, an advanced placement biology class, and her first class that she had, the teacher talked about cryptozoology, and she stated that there is possibilities that animals out there um, that we do not know about exist. And what she was trying to point out is that it's, it's, it's good to keep an open mind about things, uh, especially whenever you're in the world of science. I think cryptozoology is something that should be studied. Uh, there are a lot of good people out there who are looking for, and now cryptozoology, I have to tell you real quick, is not all about the woo. It's not all about Bigfoot. It's not all about, um, you know, um, these giant reptilian creatures living in, in, in Loch Ness. Um, 
cryptozoology actually is looking for animals that had lived here one time and they're no longer here, usually by by people. You know, usually that's the case. There are very good people out there looking for the giant auk, which was a flightless uh, uh, water-dwelling bird. Uh, people are looking for the, um, the uh, ivory-billed woodpecker from down around the Louisiana area. Uh, there are people looking for stellar sea cows out in the Arctic Ocean, which were these humongous uh, manatees uh, that went extinct at the hands of man um, probably in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So it doesn't all have to be about the woo. What it is, uh, cryptozoology is, is trying to sort out what kind of environment these kind of creatures needed, um, how they interacted with that environment, what happened whenever they left that environment, and is there enough of that previous environment left to sustain at least a remnant population of them? So it all is not about people dressed up like they're going on safari uh, looking for Bigfoot. There are actually people out there that are looking for animals that aren't quite as um, as uh, as fun, I should say, as, as our friend uh, the Bigfoot and the Yeti. All right. So what do you think the tie is? between Bigfoot and UFOs? This is a question from Brian. Brian, all right. Okay, so it's cool uh, that here in Western Pennsylvania, uh, whenever I was a kid back in 1977, we had one of the worst snowstorms ever. School was closed for about two weeks. It was so bad that the postage didn't even go through. I mean, it was really that bad here. Um, what was so interesting is, after that winter ended, there was a outburst of UFO sightings and um, Bigfoot uh, sightings. Uh, Stan Gordon wrote a book on this, and it's called The Silent Invasion. So if anybody wants to read about this kind of stuff that happened in Western Pennsylvania, that is the book to get. So what happened is, is not only there's UFOs being uh, reported and Bigfoots being reported, but they're now being reported in the same place at the same time. In a, a place called Fayette County, uh, which is not too far from me, probably about a half an hour drive, uh, there was a report about a Bigfoot scene walking a um, fence line in a field. And as it was making its way, a UFO also appeared in the sky. Um, not only did a UFO appear in the sky, but the Bigfoot creature was holding a sphere that began to emit a, a glow, uh, some sort of light, some sort of... Uh, uh, radiant light was coming from it as if it was communicating with it. Um, also, uh, around that same time, up in Lake Erie, there was a Bigfoot reported on the beach uh, by a, a large group of, of, of people uh, whenever a UFO was landing at the same time. And the UFO was described as causing a mini earthquake uh, whenever it came in for a landing. So, I'm lucky as a researcher and as somebody that has worked closely with people like Stan Gordon that um, there was something going on in the 1970s in Western Pennsylvania that had a very unique relation between the Bigfoot and the UFO phenomenon that has continued with us to this day, at least in memory of those events. What's your favorite cryptid? Oh, you got to go with Bigfoot. I mean, I wouldn't be here unless it was Bigfoot. You know, that's really what got me out there. And I don't know what the attraction is. I really don't. Because as a kid, I always liked dinosaurs. I mean, I always did. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like the Loch Ness Monster. But there's just something about Bigfoot because it's so like us in so many ways. It is One person asked me, <coughs> excuse me, if I considered uh, Bigfoot my alter ego. I think whenever you get right down to brass tacks, that might be indeed the thing. Um, Bigfoot represents uh, freedom that we don't have. Uh, it represents of, you know, quitting your job and growing your beard long and living out in the woods. Um, he doesn't work nine to five. You know, he he makes his own rules. And there is something very attractive to that. It, it, Bigfoot and, and these, these wild men are so like us. And we could be them but we cannot leave that connection with this world behind. So I guess in a way, Bigfoot is my alter ego. There are a lot of really cool cryptid stories that are out there. Before I get to Jennifer's question, 
how can we never hear anything about the the alligators underneath New York City anymore? I know. Well, that was a big thing. A huge. It was. Yeah. I remember in the 70s, they were actually even making uh, schlock films about that stuff, if you can remember. You know, somebody would come back from uh, vacation in Florida, and the father said, you know, he doesn't want the alligator anymore, and flushes it down the toilet, and somehow it either becomes contaminated or it grows, you know, to prodigious sizes, and it starts, you know, feeding upon the denizens of New York City. I have no idea what happened to that. Uh, the idea of snakes in the sewers, all this kind of stuff. Um, we probably just simply moved on to bigger and better things. And you have to also remember, uh, New York uh, City was going through a bit of a, an identity crisis whenever this was going on. And now, you know, they cleaned up Times Square. It really kind of, they really kind of polished themselves up a little bit. And I think that that kind of faded then whenever New York changed its image. Well, you know what? I, I miss those stories. I really do. We got three and a half minutes. I miss those stories too. Jennifer is asking, are there any urban goblin reports that you know of, like on train tracks and subway tunnels? Well, well, you're talking about like an actual goblin, I would assume. Um, I've not heard anything on train tracks or in subways, uh, but I was doing a conference and this young person came up to me. They were in their, in their mid-teens and he had a goblin sighting for me. And I said, uh, so I, I want to hear, hear what happened. And he said that he went out to make a sandwich in the uh, in the kitchen. He opened up the refrigerator. He closed it. And in the hallway, he saw what he said was a goblin, a very small little creature that was sitting there watching him. And the, the goblin was almost stunned as if it came upon this guy. Uh, and um, there was no intention of it happening. But uh, the goblin then simply disappeared into a a wall of light as if a portal opened or some sort of doorway opened but that was the first goblin report that i ever had now there was another report that i had i don't know if you could call this as goblins or not uh but a gentleman was taking a walk up on the chestnut ridge which is a place in western pennsylvania uh that i do a lot of research uh, the chestnut ridge for those people that don't know is a 75 five mile ridge uh that uh uh begins in, in Morgantown, West Virginia, and it goes through uh, several of our counties up here in Pennsylvania. Uh, a lot of strange things happened there. And there was a gentleman that was taking a walk, and in this clearing, he saw two things that he described as brownies, which are these little house fairies from Harry Potter, and they were wrestling with each other. And he watched it for a while, and he couldn't remember if they had clothes on or not, because their bodies so blended in with the world around them, this natural world. Uh, but anyways, as they were going about uh, gallivanting, one of them noticed the guy was watching them. Um, and then um, the thing disappeared into the side of the hill. And the guy was very clear that there was no hole there. There was no chasm. There was no way for that thing to uh, uh, exit in the side of the hill. It just kind of absorbed in the side of the hill. Now, the other one then went through an inventory of shapeshifts, which is exceedingly interesting in a, the field of cryptozoology, until it became a very large bird and flew away. As my my cat comes up here, see? Yes. That's a good-looking cat there, Guru. Oh, that is a good-looking cat. That's my good. dad's cat, yeah. That's a handsome-looking cat. Yeah. All right, quickly here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jennifer says, I've got an urban goblin story. I saw it, Ron. Where can I contact you? I have a witness as well. We got 45 seconds. All right, so there's two ways to do this, and if you can write this up. You say you go to Ronald L. Murphy Jr., Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. That's my direct link. Uh, or you can friend me or like me on Facebook, Ronald Murphy or Ronald L. Murphy Jr. is my author page. I cannot wait to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah, that'll be good. I want to hear that. We will. Next time in October, Dave, I will I will contact this person. We will talk, and we'll give you the rundown in October. Yeah, I, I'm going to need that. I'm going to need that. She says, I don't know if it was a goblin, but it sure looked like one. Hey, we'll, we'll figure this out, my dear. All right. Guru, we got you for another half an hour here on Spaced Out Radio. You're doing a great job. Ronald L. Murphy Jr., type that into Amazon. You can pick up any of his books. We love Guru time here on Spaced Out Radio. 
We've got it for another 30 minutes. And then at the bottom of hour number three, we're going to be joined by Fedora John Stetson Hudson, whatever you want to call him, for the unbiased UFO report. We'll be back with hour three of Spaced Out Radio next. All right, Guru, we're clear. All right. I'll let yeah. you chat with the audience. I'm going to take a bathroom break. All right, and this is one of my <coughs> favorite times. I love chatting with the audience. Right, you go. All right. Clear. Let's see what we've got here. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is a pretty cat. So uh, what happened was a couple days before uh, uh, Thanksgiving, my, my, my father unfortunately passed away uh, due to COVID-related pneumonia. Uh, and he had this gorgeous white cat. And I already had a cat, and uh, but I had to take the cat because it's it's just such a pretty, uh, well mannered cat. So, um, I do want to talk. Yep, there you go, Ronald o. Murphy Jr. That's right. Um, I do want to talk puck wedgie sometime. Uh, that's one of the things that I uh, that I really have interest in too. Uh, up there in the great, uh, um, what is it, the uh, the uh, Bridgewater Triangle out there in Massachusetts. Um, yeah. So brownies could be from uh, the Sealy or the Unsealy quartz, absolutely. But the way I look at this, uh, Zuni, is that uh, all fairies are very ambiguous in their nature. And I think it's very difficult to categorize them either as light or dark. I think they could be both at any time. Let's see here. Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. Uh, have, uh, uh, let's see here. Have I seen any cryptids uh, lately? I have not. Um, actually, uh, I will tell you the honest to goodness truth. I have never seen a cryptid of any kind. I, I found anecdotal evidence. I found footprints. I've heard some vocalizations, uh, but it's enough to keep me going. But I've never actually seen a cryptid. Um, yes. So, Aaron, yes. So, um, the, the, the native population uh, uh, that I've encountered, uh, both in Canada and the United States, have been one of the most, they're, they're some of the most beautiful people I've ever met. Um, and they're very open with their stories if you legitimately have um, interest in, in, in gathering knowledge from them. And I would definitely like to talk to that particular tribe. Uh, the three-foot-tall grasshopper beings have often been associated. Okay, so whenever UFOs became, and I'm not sure how old you are, Kira, but whenever UFOs uh, were starting to be seen, um, we would have uh, reports, and we have to understand, the, the idea of, of abductions and actually seeing these uh, creatures uh, probably only go back as far as uh, Barney and Betty Hill, at least in our collective imaginations. And they described them very much as greys. Uh, but there was other things going on in the 70s as well, too. Other abductions. And people describe these, these giant insect eyes. And I think that that's what we come across with this idea of these, um, these uh, uh, grasshopper type of creatures. And, uh, yes, the uh, Hockamock Swamp, uh, absolutely, up there in the Bridgewater Triangle. Uh, Native American language, I believe it's the Wampanoag which is kind of like a warning to stay away from here. Let's see here. The fuzzy alligators of Pittsburgh. Magnus, no. I do know that there is an Algonquin legend of something called the uh, uh, Aquia or the Aguaya or something like that, uh, some sort of uh, uh, creature uh, that lives uh, in the uh, rivers of Pittsburgh, but not the fuzzy alligator. Um, a real quick thing about uh, um, alligators. Um, uh, people have surmised that by the time people came to Jamestown, which was 1607, that um, alligators may have had a habitat as far north as the Potomac River. So that's something to think about, too. 
Um, the green children is something we could do an entire show on the green children, uh, black dragon. So anytime the, the, the green children of Woolpit, absolutely dude. Absolutely. Uh, exactly. enough to know who he is, Brian. Yeah. Enough to know who he is. Let's hear. All right. Appreciate that, man. Oh, no worries. Guru time. This is why we love them, people. So, <laughs> Alien Critter wants to know what the most scariest case I've ever researched. Uh, next month, uh, I will be back on, and I, I have things to tell you and things to tell Dave that have never been reported before. So we will go into all that scary stuff next month there, Dave. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect for our Halloween Guru yeah. special. Exactly. We'll talk some pretty scary stuff. Yep. That, that works for me. You got to tune in next time, Alien Critter. That's for sure. Um, after show? Yes, there will be an after show with uh, with our good friend uh, Fedora. I'm not supposed to call him Stetson anymore because I know it's not a Stetson. It's a Fedora John. All right. So we'll get that to him. I want to say a big thank you to Black Dragon, Murray, Bat Mom, Swampy, Linda, GFG, GFG, GFG. Brian, Kira, uh, Kat from Paranormal Heart, and G West for the amazing super chats tonight. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. Thank you to all the veterans who have tuned on in. You always have a home here at Spaced Out Radio. And all our regulars who are here nightly, we absolutely love you. We couldn't do it without you. You guys make it so much fun. Here comes hour three. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor let's kick off the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight my name is dave scott thank you so much for taking the time to join us we really do appreciate it hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around north america and digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Sangfroid. Sangfroid is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce the crypto guru, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. He is a fan favorite of ours, as he talks cryptids all night long. And, of course, the guru's books can be found on Amazon. Search Ronald L. Murphy Jr. He's an award winner. You will absolutely love his writing style. Guru, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, my friend. I cannot believe that we're down to our last, what are we, we, we have like 23 minutes um, and this just flew by. Are we, so we, we talk about time not existing. You know, a lot of times I, I've said things like that. Time is not linear. It's just a human construction. And, and times like this, it, it really does show because this just flew by. True. But we should tell our audience that you will be on with us next month as well, where you are going to tell some real creepy Halloween type spooky yeah. stories. And, and they're all, they're all genuine. So these, these will be stories that I usually don't share things about uh, my research. You know, I'll write about them and I'll put them into books, but a lot of things that I research come out very, very personal. And there's one particular story that I have next month that hit a lot of nerves as a dad and everything. So I do want to bring that up. So I probably have at least a couple hours of stories that, uh, that has happened in my own personal investigations that you guys will be the first ever to listen to. All right, we look forward to that next month for our Halloween special with the Guru. Evan is asking, have we been able to figure out how long Sasquatch live? Yeah. Well, again, so these are all great questions, um, but we have to assume that, first of all, that, that Bigfoot is a flesh and blood animal. Um, so we can look at, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, 
relatives, if you will, in the natural world. And you could say, you know, how long does a silverback gorilla live? You know, how long does a human being live? So I would think that, you know, a range that you would put on there is, you know, for a high range, anywhere from like 35 to 55 years old. Um, but the wild is a very dangerous place. And I would doubt that a creature like that would make it very long in the wild. But I mean, it's extremely possible as well, too. But, it, but from just from a biological point of view, it's very rare that these kind of creatures would reach um, a very ancient age in the wild. Wow. All right. Well, let's move on to TFV. Are gargoyle cryptids and anything interesting about them as of late? Have you had any new reports? No. You know, there was this uh, gargoyle wave of sightings in uh, my neck of the woods uh, a few years ago where people were seeing this creature that looked like it had these leathery wings. Um, it had this very odd shaped oval head that went back almost to a crest and it was very odd but people were seeing these in an area called shakura uh which is a few you know 20 or so miles outside of pittsburgh and uh, they called it the shakura gargoyle um i started to look at some uh some of the uh uh eyewitness reports and what it seemed to me is this um Again, I brought this up before at a conference, and a lot of people say that I was full of it. But what the, the this gargoyle seemed to look like is somebody that was wearing, if not a wingsuit, but somebody that might have been using some sort of paraglider. Um, the what they were saying was an elongated head looked very much in the drawings as somebody that was wearing a helmet that was um, built for aerodynamics. And the, the, these wings that they said it, it had looked almost like a cape as if it could have been um, uh, 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 one of these sailing suits that people wear. Now, those are very expensive. Uh, this area would not be a prime area for such things. But if somebody was going to orchestrate um, a hoax, uh, that would be the way to do it. So the jury is still out on there. But I think that I can find a lot of antecedents in the modern world that looks like this was, if not an outright hoax, somebody, you know, misinterpreted what they saw to be something that was very human in origin. All right. Have you ever heard of the fuzzy alligators in Pittsburgh? Magnus wants to know. No. And whenever you were on your hiatus there, I, I, I never heard about this before. Um, the Algonquin Indians around the, uh, the, the three rivers there in Pittsburgh, uh, reported that there was something called an agua, something along those lines. I think it was probably pronounced close to agua, um, but um, of course it would have been, you know, anglicized and everything. Um, but they reported that before the white settlers came into the area, there was a creature that that occupied these these rivers in Pittsburgh that would come up and snatch deer from the bank. Okay, well they fed. A couple things about this. Uh, are these boogeyman stories that keep native children away from a very dangerous river? Possibly. Um, could it be um, a very large fish? Uh, well, the only thing that could bring a deer down off of an embankment would possibly be a bull shark. And we know that you can get to the Ohio River if you really try hard enough uh, by going up the Mississippi River. So a bull shark indeed could have done such a trip. And that could have been the origins of this. Um, but as I was saying to the viewers before you came on, um, at the founding of Jamestown in 1607, it has been speculated that the, um, the American Alligators Range may have been as far north as the Potomac River in Virginia. Uh, that being said, if there would have been a period of, of drought seasons and very um, mild winters, um, it's, it's, it's not probable uh but it is possible that an alligator could have come as far as pittsburgh all right tfv is asking have you ever looked into flying rods i have um so the, the show and this was one of the greatest shows i think uh that was ever on television that was called monster quest um it did a great show on these flying rods and what it showed is that these rods seem to be um insects that whose flights 
matched up with the photography of the film or the photography of the camera that was being utilized. So it would appear as a very elongated um, tube with um, these kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, leathery wings that were flying through. I think that is indeed what has been going on in most cases. I received, and this is probably going back six years ago, I received a video uh, from somebody's game camera who lived, you know, about 20 miles from where I was. And he said, take a look at this. So there was what you would call a rod, one of the stereotypical type of rods, you know, that, that straight line. But it appeared as if it had a thorax. Now, this was in the wintertime, and you might be able to say it was a bug. Now, you could probably even say that it was a bug in the wintertime because strange things happen. I have found frogs and snakes uh, wandering around in the snow before. So it's not beyond the question that a stray bug is still out whenever there's snow on the ground. But what is interesting is whatever this rod was, it actually grabbed the game camera and moved it. Um, so that's the first time I've ever seen anything like that. That was the last time I've ever seen anything like that. But, um, of course the jury is still out. The search still goes on. All right. Follow up. What about the one over in the airport and in an urban setting? Um, a rod are we talking about or, yes. okay. I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one particular. I, I, I don't, I don't know that one. Um, I've not seen any video evidence of that or anything, but, uh, I will definitely look that up. All right. Uh, Zoon is asking, what's your thoughts on the beast of Javodin? Of uh, Javodin. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about guys. Uh, this is like a show in and of itself. So this is during the French and Indian War. Um, so France already is pretty strapped uh, for money. Uh, they're fighting the first world war that has theaters in, in you know, right. I actually live in an area where uh, much of the French and Indian war was fought um, 10 miles down the road. We have forts that are dedicated to this, you know, so this was a time whenever France was at war and what happens is in the outskirts of the peasant communities, um, people start showing up dead. And I'm not talking about like one or two people. Uh, some people put the kill total up as high as 300 people. This is something very serious going on to the point that King Louis is having a bit of a problem with it. His, his people are, are, are scared. And even though he's at war, he still sends out an attachment of his royal, royal huntsmen to try to kill this. And they assume that it's a wolf. Although the people that report seeing this creature said it's about the size of a cow. Um, you know, it's a very large creature, something like they've never seen before. Um, but the killings go on. The huntsmen come out. They kill a particular animal. Uh, it's a very, very large wolf. They have it stuffed. They take it to King Louis. Um, but guess what? Uh, like the next day, like three children are killed at one time. Like it, it's just so bizarre. Um, and then they send a guy out by the name of Jean Chastel, who says he's going to be able to get this creature. And he uses nothing. He uses a silver bullet. The first time silver uh, is ever used against uh, one of these kind of creatures. And he kills it. A very, very large wolf that doesn't actually appear uh, to be a wolf. It's something strange, what have you. Um, but as you look deeper into the story, um, this is the time of um, the Enlightenment. And people wanted to show how intelligent they were by having menageries, which are like private zoos. And people would have peacocks, and sometimes they would have, you know, other strange things, bears and such. We know Jean Chastel had a menagerie. We also know that he had lions in that menagerie, and we also know that he had hyenas in that menagerie. One of my theories is, because he became quite rich after this, one of my theories is he simply opened the door to his menagerie, let a few of his animals out, um, and they preyed upon the people. Uh, there was enough hysteria going around wherever he then went out, became the hero, and collected a very large sum of money. That's, that, that is probably the most logical thing that happened, but some people also are claiming that it's a werewolf, which, you know, there's also speculation that maybe one of Jean Chastel's family members was a werewolf. 
and he knew how to get rid of it, and that's what happened to the Beast of Jevaudan. But that's a show in and of itself, one of my favorite stories. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. All right, let's go to another question. Joe is asking, have you ever heard of the Van Meter Monster? I have. That is like what a, is this one about? Yeah, okay, this is like um, – this is kind of like a Mothman. This is kind of like a Spring Hill Jack. This is kind of um, uh, Jack the Ripper all rolled into one. A very strange type of uh, uh, Victorian thing uh, that was seen. Um, uh, sparks flying from his, his, his heels. Um, he, he could fly. He could shoot fire and lightning from his uh from his um from his uh, hands and from his eyes, just a really really weird type of uh, incident that was going on. What kind of creature is it? We don't know. I, nobody knows. I mean, I, whenever you uh, whenever you look at it, you can't really say that this is a cryptid. Uh, you could say it is. Some people assume that it was an extraterrestrial uh, because it seemed to have so many kind of. Uh, um, uh, attributes that would, you know, electricity and stuff like that. Um, some people claim that it was a demon, and some people claim that it was just simply a, a figment of the imagination or a stunt pulled off by the newspaper. Weird. Yeah, there's a lot of that that kind of goes around, though, isn't there? There is. Yeah. So th before television, um, you know, people had to sell newspapers, uh, and they would sometimes come up with very outlandish stories. In my opinion, most of the stories are not outlandish, okay? I think every now and then you would have some journalists that would go out there and make up a story to sell papers. But I think a lot of these, these newspapers were truly reporting on instances that were being told to them. So it's very hard because you could say all these newspaper stories that talk about giants. Well, that was just trying to sell newspapers. Not in those cases, I don't think. Things like the Van Meter Monster, probably. Giants, absolutely not, because you would find them, you know, in the late 1800s up into the early 1900s, whenever people were reporting getting, you know, finding giants on the property. And one of the interesting things about this is whenever these giants were uncovered, it usually named a name, you know, it had a source to it. It wasn't anything that was anonymous. So I think that uh, whenever we look at uh, newspapers, it cannot always be ruled out as some sort of um, um, a trick to sell newspapers. I think there is serious journalism going on there, too. Guru, we got you for another seven minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Crypto guru Ronald Murphy talking weird creatures all night long. Ron, I, I know I've asked you this in the past, but I love asking you this question because our audience is always changing. Mm -hmm. We know about Bigfoot. We know about Dogman, goblins, gargoyles, mermaids, sea monsters. What is your favorite lesser known cryptid that needs more research and, and needs to get out the public a little bit more? Wow, that is a good one, man. Um, well, there's this one called a water hound uh, in Ireland. Um, I, I, I cannot begin to... Uh, to give you the uh, Irish tra translation of that name. Um, but it seems to represent a very large otter. I mean, at least that's how it's portrayed. Uh, to the point that somebody back in the 1800s was actually killed by one of these creatures and somebody uh, drew a picture on the tombstone. Um, people report seeing this creature to this day. Um, and we do know that otters are capable of getting very, very large. And we also know, it's kind of like that Australia effect, we know that they're not all cute and cuddly little animals. They're predatory creatures. Um, but this creature was big enough to occasionally um, chase down people and prey upon people. Uh, so the, the the water hound or the water dog of Ireland is really one of my uh, favorite ones. Uh, the gray man of the highlands of Scotland, uh, Ben McDewey, uh, is one of my favorites as well, too. Um, sometimes it appears as a Bigfoot creature. Sometimes it appears as a gray mist. That's another one that is extremely uh, uh, close to uh, my heart as well. Um, and, um, you know, I think you just have little regional things like the puck wedgie up in Massachusetts. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the Albert Witch here in Pennsylvania, which is kind of like a, a little mini version of Bigfoot. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's really too many to mention. I would love to be out in the field looking for any of them. You know which one really hits for me is over in Iceland with wow. with, all, with all of the little people. Yeah, that's right. Where, where literally, if they 
assume there is little people in an area. They will divert roads. That's right. They will divert construction yep. in yep. order to protect these creatures. Yep. It happens all the time, as a matter of fact. If they're building a road and they come across even a boulder, you know, something that reminds them or something that um, elicits some sort of feeling that this belongs to these little creatures, they will, as you said, divert entire highway systems around these things. So you'll have a tree standing out in the middle of nowhere and the highway going by because they believed it was the home of a, uh, of, a, of, a of an elf, a fairy creature, what have you. Gnome Squatch says, Night crawlers are quite underrated. Yeah, night crawlers are a little underrated, but there's very little known about them as well, too. Uh, besides those couple of videos, there's really nothing else has been 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 done by, about them. Uh, I would love to see more more evidence about them, but uh, as of now, people are saying that it's you know it's a hoax because we don't have anything else. For Behoff, Duende. What's oh, the, what's the Duende? Okay, that's kind of like the South American version of um, of a gnome. Uh, but the cool thing about duende, though, uh, that's actually a, a Celtic word, and that refers to um, a group of fairies, a group of um, uh, the ancestral race, I guess you could say. It's the uh, the genesis for these kind of supernatural creatures. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Why yeah. do you think we don't focus on the little cryptids very much? Like like the little people First Nations talk about, like the gnomes, like the the leprechauns in Ireland, where there's literally forests that are that have areas that you could not enter because they believe leprechauns live there. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of this folklore of little people as we got three minutes left. Yeah. Well, I will answer the way uh, J.R.R. Tolkien described it. He said that the uh, Victorians ruined our perception of little people. Uh, they so uh, infanticide, you know, they are so uh, they made them into uh, things of, of children. They, they made them into, uh, you know, fairy tales that they have lost their luster and they have lost any kind of... Uh, of uh, reality in our world. Uh, so I blame the, those gosh darn Victorians that made them into something that they weren't and that we kind of pushed them away from us now and we won't believe in them anymore because they're the stuff of, you know, fairy tales. Do they need more research? Oh, absolutely. That's 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 my big thing. Like, if you would say, Ron, what do you believe in? Is there a Bigfoot? Is there this? Is there that? I would say that these could all be explained as manifestations of the elemental intelligences that we need to study even more. Wow. B. Yeah. Hop says, I only know about the Duende by researching goblins. Pretty sure I encountered one as a child. Wow. I wonder where that was located. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. Guru, we got about just over 90 seconds left with you tonight, and it is always a pleasure to have you here on Spaced Out Radio. You are like family around here, I and that. I look forward to you coming back on the show in October where we're going to get into a lot of spooky stories that you've never told on any other show before. That's exactly right. And um, I guess you have the capability. How about like in the next month, I start sending over some pictures as well, too, so we can share some pictures of some of the uh, things I've encountered as well. Well, our radio audience will have to check out the archives for that. Okay. Thing. Okay. Tell our listeners where they can find you, your information, and all your books. Okay, so you go to Amazon. That's where everything is done anymore on Amazon. You can theoretically go to your local bookstore and order my books there as well, too. Uh, but they're going to charge you, you know, shipping and handling. So I would just do the uh, the uh, the Amazon thing. It's going to be a lot cheaper for you. Uh, or you could contact me directly, and I would have no problem sending you out a book for probably far cheaper than it would cost for you to buy it uh, on Amazon. Uh, you can get in touch with me with Ronald L. Murphy Jr. at yahoo.com. That is my direct email address. I would love to talk to you. Um, find me on Facebook, Ronald Murphy, or and uh, like my uh, my author page, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. Uh, and uh, I will be doing. Really no big conferences this year because of the whole COVID thing. Uh, but hopefully 2022 will uh, be a whole new world and we'll be able to get out there and I'll be able to actually meet people in person. Guru, thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio once again. You were like family. It's been about six years since we've been doing this, man. Yeah. 
And mm. I, I really appreciate you, brother. Man, I appreciate you too, Dave. I love you as a brother. That's that's true. And uh, the reason I like coming on this show is because every single one of these individuals really have a desire to get to the bottom of, of these questions and life. Absolutely. And I'm glad I'm here for it. Yes. All right. Coming up next, we have John Hudson in the Unbiased UFO Report and so much more on Spaced Out Radio next. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate, Guru. I appreciate it. I really do. And all these people over here, I hope that I do hear from you guys. Um, I would love to talk. Even if you do not agree with my point of view, I like to listen to other people's uh, opposing points of view because that can only, uh, uh, you know, enliven me and educate me more. Uh, so, yeah, I would love to be able to talk to these guys more. But seriously, next month, put it on the, uh, on the calendar. It's going to be an awesome show. Yeah, next month you – will be with us on the 15th october sounds 15th excellent. sounds excellent all right sounds excellent. all right buddy i gotta run here yeah. i gotta get ready for yeah. the ufo report yeah. I, I love you brother and thank you for saving the beard yeah. for this show okay that's right that's right we'll see you next time brother we gotta get a robe for you a special robe and staff oh you cut out too quick I think the guru needs a robe and staff. That's what I think. I think that'd look awesome. I think that would look completely awesome for the guru. Mm-hmm. I believe it. I totally believe it. Hey, Chad Smith, what's happening? I am Chad Smith. I am Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. No middle name, just I'm Chad Smith. I'm Chad Smith. I am Chad Smith. Who the hell are you? You're a Chad one, Mr. Smith. Mm. Be humble, be helpful. That's what Chad Smith always told me as a kid. Good advice there, Behoff. Chad Smith is the Chad Smith. Magnus, Chad, I am Chad Smith. Smith, very nice. Sandra needs more Chad in her life. Witchy says, Chad Smith, you are a nice one. That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, Justin's apparently Chad Smith. All right, here comes Fedora John, a.k.a. Chad Smith. How are you doing, sir? Good buddy, how are you? You hear me okay? Yep, yep, can hear you fine. Wonderful, wonderful. I got another friggin' moth in here. I got two of them in here now. Your your selection of, of the things that you like and don't like, the things that, that you're afraid of and not afraid of, completely violate all laws of logic. Hmm. Don't blame me. Blame Chad Smith. There you go. Mm-hmm. That one's on my Texas flag. That one's up on the roof. Mm-hmm. Oh, you there? I am. Yeah, sorry. I had a small network problem for a second. Had to fix. Oh, that's okay. Hey, Logan. How you doing, buddy? How's your throat doing? Not bad. Good. Not bad. I'm not afraid of the moths. I just can't stand moths. They're annoying. 
I got to get rid of this guy. This guy's pissing me off here. Hold on. I'm not even going to kill this guy. Oh, he got away. He got away. Oh, see, now he went behind the wall and, oh, son of a gun. He saw me coming. I, I moved too quick. I moved way too quick. I needed more stealth there, and I didn't do it. All right, big thank you to Spooky, G West, Cat, Kira, Brian, GFG, 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 Linda, Swampy, Bat Mom, Murray, and Black Dragon for the awesome super chats. <clears throat> hey, Smoky Mountain Wanderer, how are you? And the fellow Chad Smithians, thank you to all the veterans tuning on in because we absolutely love it here you always have a safe home here with us thank you to all of our regulars who are tuning in don't forget the after show with john happens right after this here we go everyone We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button, our website, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the unbiased UFO report. Fedora John Hudson is back, and you know we love it when he's here breaking down the latest UFO news. John, it is always a pleasure to have you here, my friend. And you know what? I'm going to grind my teeth through this first one. <laughs> I am going to grind my teeth. Tom DeLong getting vindication through an Esquire magazine article. Come on. You, you know, I almost didn't even bother putting any other items in, in my list for I figured this won't be <laughs> one article will take all of our time. But yeah, I mean, first off, I, I, you know, I think that the person who wrote this has been listening to your show, and I think, I think they wrote this just for you. Um, uh, one hell of a title. Um, you know, the way it was written, it almost seems like um, this might have somehow been tied into that video interview we saw recently with him on the beach. If it's not the same interview, then he was doing multiple interviews the same day because the writer describes the same scene that we saw in the video interview of him. Um, but, you know, I I got to say, I was I was kind of blown away by the article. It was actually a, a kind of an interesting article. And um, the, the writer of it um, really uh, put a lot of effort into rationalizing and grasping the concepts that that tom was talking about and i mean you know as well as i do how tom talks right i mean he 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 takes some of the the deeper uh concepts that you and i you know deal with in our research and and just kind of you know just dumps them out into conversation <laughs> you know just blah 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 and it catches people off guard and she and she really tried to um uh, she really tried to internalize it and um and they talked about they talked about spoon bending they talked about bigfoot they talked about um you know ufos they talked about um you know he he explained his hypothesis that essentially um that that time is 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 unified and that you know that uh, all timelines happen at the same time and that ufos are just uh, others from other timelines that are able to slip through to our timeline and that they're more like submarines displacing space time than than ships and i mean he he covers the gambit um it was actually it was a it, for for an interview that wasn't very long, it, it, he covered the gambit of of topics, and the writer um, really tried to grasp what he was talking about. And uh, I I don't know if they succeeded or not, but what I was kind of surprised that I came away with was 
this realization that if if someone who's totally foreign to these concepts is is presented these concepts in a in an in an, in an environment where they have an open mind, um, I guess what I'm coming to is it 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 left me with a with a a lot more hope than I thought it would that essentially a lot of the more difficult concepts that that folks like you and I study are are going to be actually considered and 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 people are going to actually try to understand them that that don't do this kind of research. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. And and you know Esquire magazine's a pretty big magazine to do a to do a an article on. I I get yeah. that. And I can appreciate the the run on that and the fact that he did the article. Good for him. Do you think that with his recent podcast that he did with Jim Semivan and he's done now two interviews, do you think that he's trying to rebuild his name in ufology right now? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and personally, um, you know, uh, I would advise him to do that exact thing. Now, on that same personal note, I would suggest he he did a little bit longer, um, give a little more, you know, give him a little more breathing room between you know uh, past events and now. But I think I think he feels a fair amount of pressure to do this because of of what he thinks is coming next. And and then the flip side of it too is that he still is the CEO of a media company that is producing movies and and books. Books that a lot of the people in this community actually really enjoy. And so there is still a business there to support. And, you know, he needs to have a, a uh, at least somewhat of a, of, a, of a reputation in this field to be able to be CEO of a company like that. So well, I think outside, he has to. Outside of, outside of UFO Twitter, he has no reputation. He blew that reputation. Well, that's what I thought. But he just got this beautiful article on uh, Esquire. I yeah, mean, but any, anybody could write a fluff piece though. I know, I know, but I guess, I guess what I found myself thinking about Dave and, and it kind of made me giggle a little bit to be really honest with you because of the conversations you and I've had, but it's, it's the realization that um, the average person is not going to take the kind of discerning eye to Tom DeLong that a lot of people in this community would or, or have. And, um, and so they're going to look at a lot of, of little pieces of information that are in the mainstream media and stitch those together to form an opinion of him. And uh, my personal guess at this point is that he pulls it off. My personal guess at this point is that he, he does get vindicated. And at least in the mainstream media, he becomes a bit of a, of a darling when it comes to this topic. Well, we'll see how much media attention he could get because, I mean, his sister, Carrie DeLong, is his press person. And well, he could just take his clothes off. and You know, I mean, it's worked before. Well, yeah. <laughs> so it does. You know, look, I don't have anything against Tom DeLong, the, the gentleman. I don't know the man. I will fully admit I like Blink-182. I wish he would go back there. Okay? I really do. Okay, the album "Take Off Your Clothes and Jacket" was was fantastic. It really was. But he has just, to me, I'm going to put it this way: Tom DeLong to me is everything that is wrong with ufology. And I know that's a strong statement to make, but from not going from alienating the UFO people who've been doing this for decades, the experiencers who've been experiencing for decades. He had an opportunity. I was told by an insider this, very close to this situation. They knew, starting the TTSA, that they had an opportunity to really bring ufology together and really make a major, major statement with all of us behind them. They had more people than every... NFL stadium filled behind them. And the first thing that they did was they cut out ufology. They cut out all the researchers. They cut out all, everybody who had experiences. They cut out their biggest supporters. And that was one of the black eyes that killed the TTSA and sees it in the remnants we see it today. And that's all because of DeLong. 
It's not because of Semi Van. It's not because of Robert Bigelow. It's not because of Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon or Steve Justice or Hal Putoff or anybody else involved. Gary Nolan for his short time when he was there. Okay. This is all on DeLong. And for the fact that he's now going to try and rebuild himself. Hey, I'm all about second chances, but are you going to do it right this time? Or are you going to play rock star again in the UFO field? Well, hey, look, look, Dave, I think what it comes down to is, is I think that one, I think, I think all your criticisms of, of, of the way he handled this are, are all very valid in, in almost everyone's eyes. I think that your emotional reaction to that stuff is, is completely valid and normal because this is a, this is a, a, a research field that, that you obviously care a little more than a little about, right? I mean, you've put a lot of your personal life into this, into this field, right? And he basically, you know, flittered on odor over and danced all over the, the, the semi. I mean, it's like, I mean, he, he, like everything you said, he did to something that a lot of uh, people really care about and, and should care about. And so it's hard not to take offense to that. And I totally, I totally get that. Um, but I, I, for me, um, you know, while I liked Blink-82, I wasn't a big fan. For me, it's that, um, with me, to be very honest, it's me. Tom and I are, are close to the same age. We both grew up in California around the same time. We had a lot of the same influences. To me, he's just another UFO nut that loves the topic and got a, a little over his skis. And, and so if he wants that. to slide back into that researcher role, I'm all for that. I'm all for that, too. Okay, but he he's been put on a pedestal since day one. Yes. Okay, when he was named by the International UFO Congress as Researcher of the Year before his book came out and before the Two the Stars Academy even was formed. All right, because organizers, certain organizers for that event were already kissing his butt. Yeah. All right, it was, kind of, it was kind of like when they gave Obama the um, uh, what was it? The was it Nobel? No, was it? The Nobel Peace Prize, I think it was. Two gave it to him like his, like his, fir his first year. No, but I'm saying it was a similar idea that, that he got that someone got an award for what they were going to do versus what they had already done. And, Absolutely. And because of the amount of excitement, right? And and then it hurt them because they got it too early, right? So right. that's the comparison I'm okay, drawing. Yeah. I see where you're um, going. With that. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it was um, you know, it, it um no, I mean, I totally forgot about that. And um, you know. Oh yeah. I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a, it, it, yeah. I mean, look, I guarantee you in hindsight, well, I would hope in hindsight, he would play this out completely differently. I don't uh, see and it. I, I uh, and maybe you're right. And maybe that's just who Tom is, but I agree with what you said earlier. And it, and it bothers me personally that I think there was an opportunity. I think there was a really, a really nice, there's always going to be division. There's always going to be Pepsi versus Coke, but I think there was a real opportunity to, to create a unifying um, a group within this community and they didn't just not pull it off. They, they went in the complete opposite direction yeah. and in many ways made it worse. And, you know, I wish I could give up my source on that. I really, really wish I could give up my source because my source is very close to this situation and has filled me in on a lot of the back story of what happened there. And well, I, honestly, I don't think you. I don't think you need to give away your source. I don't think what you. I don't think. I don't think what your source told you is is it in any way, shape, or form unbelievable. I, I think no. it's something most people would just accept as true because it sounds. It sounds completely logical. No, I I understand that, my man. I understand that. My thing is now I'm grinding my gears because I was happy that Tom DeLong had gone away. <laughs> okay. I really was because I was sick of the game. I was sick of the, what if I told you I was, yeah, sick that, that was, that I was, was sick hard. of the posts that he would post some fake UFO video and two hours later would yank it down, which by the way, insiders tell me this was a big, big no, no for that group. And he, they asked him a number of times to stop. And finally they started threatening him that if you continue this, we are going to resign. That is insider info right there. Okay. I, I heard it went as far as, as as people developing a little bit of PTSD that when their phones would go off, they were scared that oh oh no, oh no, what's what's yes. what's Tom done now? <laughs> what's Tom done now? I mean, here's the thing. I even put this in my 14 reasons. Okay, there's a time to rock star 
and there's a time yeah. not to rock yeah. star. And really throughout great. his TTSA career, it's uh, he's always chosen time not to rock star to rock star. If that makes any sense, he he's consistent. I'll give him that. Yes, very very consistent. And I just, I hope he comes in with a different attitude. I don't expect it. I expect it to be much the same where it's screw you, ufology. I'll do what I want and look what I got and look at me and follow me once again. Well, and, his, his, go ahead. So go ahead. I was going to say his, his theory of everything interview he did with Jim Simivan sitting there with him. Um, he, he was, he, if he'd been, if he'd behaved like that from the beginning, it would have been a whole different ball game. He was, Semivan was clearly had, had, had a huge influence on him. Well, I mean, that is a, that is a good mentor to have. And, and one of the big questions is in the UFO world, why is Semivan, uh, stepped with him and stuck with him? And I do know that Semivan has listened to our show to, Check out what we've said about this whole situation. He has. He's probably hoping Tom will teach him those three chords he knows. God, I need to learn those three chords again. <laughs> I almost got two of them. I got two of them. I need that third one. I forget it again. All right. We got time for one more story here, my friend. And yes. the Demi Lovato trailer is released. Let's stick with the celebs. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, I mean... Um, yeah, it's I don't I don't think it's bad. I mean it's it's I mean everyone should check it out. I'll post a link later. Um, you know, uh, you know, the hard thing for me is I don't have a terribly strong opinion of uh or or a, a terribly happy view of pretty much all the other paranormal content out there. And so she doesn't have a huge bar to hit, you know. And with that in mind, I, I think it's kind of interesting, you know. I, I mean I'll check it out you know, at least one episode. I, I encourage everyone to check it out. She's she's definitely taking it seriously. Hey, I'll be the bad guy here again, times two. All right. Boy, you're you're coming off looking like roses tonight. <laughs> All right. I think and, and I haven't seen the trailer yet, but I've I've seen some photo shoots, I've seen some interviews, and I've talked to people who have worked with this show. And this is one thing I'll say. They say it's something different. It's something new. I think Demi Lovato is going to bring in an entirely young core of people who will now have interest. That's the pluses. What I would have liked to have seen is I would love to have seen her not investigating on her own because now it looks more like Rob Lowe and his sons running around America looking for Bigfoot ghosts and, and aliens. I would like to have seen her and her two friends have somebody in the UFO field, a real veteran, doesn't matter who it is, a real trusted veteran. Go Rob along. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Just Absolutely. one Obi-Wan Kenobi to go exactly. on with you on your adventure. Yep. Absolutely. I and I think that would change the entire dynamic of yeah. the show. But unfortunately for her in the UFO world, she is going to be laughed at. The TV companies, they don't care because what they look at is 55 million people following her on Twitter and another 55 plus million following her on Instagram. And that is their audience. That whole upcoming Disney uh, p uh, kids who grew up with her are all watching it. They're following now, her music. My daughter is one of them. I know. And I agree with everything you said. Now, the one danger to all of us, the one danger that we all have to consider is that she got initiated by Greer. Yes. And so uh, all this press that she's creating could bring Greer a lot of influence. And while she may end up being a welcomed member of our community, we all know the challenges we have with Greer. I hope she follows through. And this isn't just a one hit wonder like most of her music. All right, John, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you so well, much. No, I'll be around in a couple minutes, yeah? Yeah, for the round table. Yeah, yep, yep. Okay. Radio side, though. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, yep, yep. All right, here we go. Thank you, sir. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show. Let's see what Shirky Poo 
has for us tonight. If there's a dentist out there willing to treat an apex predator underwater, we've got a gig for you. A recent cage diving expedition around Mexico's Guadalupe Island revealed a great white shark with a mouth that didn't have many teeth in it. No, th you know what? I think this great white's been playing hockey up here in Canada, literally missing almost all its front teeth. Yeah, I bet you this thing has fought. You know, there's not really many tough guys in the NHL anymore, so I think it fought Ryan Reeves. Yeah, I think so. Because this thing looks like, no, we're not talking jaws here. We're talking gums. Pretty unusual for a shark to have that many missing teeth. Martin Graff, owner of Shark Diver, has said, another, anyone know a dentist? He goes and posts on his Instagram account after taking the photo of the missing tooth shark. It's definitely a Canadian shark. Canadian great white. Had to be born up here. Yeah, but hmm, doesn't need any crest uh, toothpaste, that's for sure. Moving on. Near the end of August, residents of Mississauga, Ontario, where we broadcast on Saga 960 AM, spotted a UFO flying through the sky. It was clearly documented, undeniable evidence that aliens were in the center of the universe. However, there's a plot twist here. It was not a UFO. No, it was an enlarged helium-induced Mr. Peanut that was floating across the sky. Yes, you know, you know, I'm even looking at this. You can totally tell it's Mr. Peanut. Come on, Mississauga. We're better than this. This is why I am so glad Jody and the crew have actually picked up our show the last almost two years now, almost two years we've been broadcasting on Saga 960, because now I can tell you the difference between a Mr. Peanut hot air balloon and a UFO. Thank goodness for Spaced Out Radio on Saga 960. I know Jody's going to laugh at that when she gets this show. I know she's going to hear this because she listens all the time. Jody, we're winning now. We are winning on Saga 960 because we are telling the audience that Mr. Peanut Balloons are not UFOs. Speaking of UFOs, debris from several UFO cases dating back to 1947 are now being studied by Dr. Gary Nolan at Stanford University's Nolan Lab. In a recent interview with KQED, Nolan has discussed how he got involved in UFO studies and is loving his new research. Nolan says that working on UFOs, metamaterials, nothing like it. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with little brother is watching bumblefoot is the official music of spaced out radio rocking her in and out of every single show get your horns up for the guitar god himself special thanks to everybody listening in at home at work in your cars wherever you may be thanks to everyone in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, hanging out at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends... We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Cosmic Floor is playing the role of Roy tonight. One sec, John. Good show, everybody. You all did well tonight. You all did well this week. Howard, how are you, man? 
All right. <sighs> Little Johnny Hudson. Hey, Super Gary, are you still awake, man? Bumble my foot, please. Little Johnny Hudson, little Johnny is, Hudson. Is, is there too much glare, or, or can you can you see that at all? Um, I can kind of see that. Oh, yeah. Well, so so you notice the right, uh, right, like right here. There's that that white like ball of light thing. Well, it's not. It's like a splatter of light yeah. right there. That just appeared. Yeah in my daughter's room, setting off the motion detector, and then disappeared. Cool. Yeah. And, uh, cool. and my, da my daughter's not sleeping in there tonight. She's actually sleeping in my room at the moment. And so uh, and my I got to check, but I'm pretty sure my Labrador is in there with them. And I mean, it, it completely could be a reflection of light coming from something, but I, I don't know what, and I'm, I'm kind of excited because I, I see all those other people with all these crazy, like, you know, like uh, kid motion videos of all these weird things. And I've never gotten anything before. So like, you got some aliens I, there. I, I'm kind of excited. I'm like, wow, cool. Right, that's I don't even care what it is. Little Johnny got some aliens something. Something over there. Be kind of neat. My guess is it's just some glare from something, but I'm really curious. Okay. I want to quickly start off and say something here, all right, because I've had a few people come up to me about what I said last night during my Dave 101, am I quitting ufology, okay? Oh. What I mean by that, and if you listen uh, to it again, you'll understand my point. We're not quitting covering UFO topics or subjects on Spaced Out Radio, what I'm meaning is I am done with trying to track down the major stories. I'm done with trying to, to haul people in here, get the story first and go into, uh, you know, trying to, uh, help people out and people, you know, like a lot of times I'll get conferences or whatever that will come out and say, Hey, uh, can we get you a bunch of guests on the show? And, and all of this, and there's never anything in return. You know, that's kind of what I'm getting at. I, I'm not interested in the, I, I'm still going to be studying ufology. I'm still going to be talking ufology. I, I want to focus more on the, the experiential side of everything, because in the end, phase three of all of this is the experiencer. All right, we're in phase two right now. Phase three is about the experiencer. So I'm not pulling away as a person. When I say I hate ufology, I hate what it's become. Okay, I hate what it's what it's standing for right now. All right, let's get Gary. Gary wants to join us, okay? Yeah, yeah totally. If, if I can just maybe uh, cast that in the, from a different point of view just to see if it helps people or not. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a there's a there's kind of an ante like when you're playing poker, right? There's kind of an ante involved in being in this community, and there there is a collection of people that that do interview cycles. There is a collection of conferences that occur, and there's kind of this main theme of 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 uh, of people that kind of march through this community th that um you know that basically every single show has to. Uh, subscribe to and you have to interview those people and you have to put a lot of work in to get, in to get in the show. you have to support the, the right. conferences and there's a sunk cost to all that it's not it's not cheap i mean it's not it's not nothing it, it's there's a big cost to it and so at some point everyone has to evaluate what are they getting for that right and if they're not getting you know it, and it may be that it may may differ over a six month period right it doesn't mean it's, it's always going to be this way but I think everyone eventually has to evaluate what is that cost of, of participating at that level with that flow of information and, and what, you know, what is my, what, what are my listeners really getting for that? Right. And well, I think that's just another way of phrasing it. That's it. You know, and you know, Gary and I've been talking quite a bit about this in as Gary has kind of taken over the day-to-day -day operations of running the, the business side 
of Spaced Out Radio, a lot of work behind the scenes in what he's doing, and he's really adding the glue to a lot of areas. And, uh, you know, one of the things that him and I have talked about recently is, you know, what is our purpose in ufology? Okay, uh, we got, I'll give you an example. We got screwed on the Wilson documents. That story was supposed to break on our show, not on another radio show. I okay, I was told I was told about the Wilson documents literally two, three months before they came out. And I was told by certain people that that story was going to break on SOR. We got screwed. Were you ever given a reason for why? I know the reason. I've okay. accepted the apology. Okay. Okay, but I was really, really pissed off. Really pissed off. And you know that's well. We'll that's, see how things play out. In hindsight, that might not have been. It might be. It might be not a bad thing to be too attached to those documents. We'll see what happens. Well, e but I understand your concern. Well, you know, it's, no, you make up a good point. The journalism side is okay. I got screwed on my story. Yeah. All right. I got screwed on my story, and I sat quietly on it. Who's my guest tonight? Guru. So, I mean, that is just one little instance of, of some things that kind of happened there. Okay? Now, I, I don't want UFO Twitter blowing up on this or whatever. All right? Because as a journalist you know that sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose, and sometimes you're going to get egg on your face. Just the way the system works. All right? But in the end, it was one of those things that really affected, you know, a lot of, a lot of trust in this. Add to the fact that, you know, we get approached by a lot of conferences every year. We don't get asked to pr help promote them. And Gary will see this going into 2022, okay? Uh, but here's the thing. Hey, Bill F. and Murray, how you doing, buddy? Oh, wow. And uh, Yes, says, we do, hey. Bill. We need to have lunch. <laughs> you know, but uh, Paula Yuyu, how you doing over from Twitter? I mean, Twitch. Glad you're here on this side. Um, you know, there are certain things that happen behind the scenes that a lot of people don't see. We get a lot of, uh, of people trying to promote their, their conferences on the air, which usually I never minded up until this point. But when it's the third, fourth, or fifth year in a row, and you're not asked to speak at that event, that's that, why am I doing this? And but, I'm, but and a, a counterexample... Is the big phone home where, you know, they did want to include you guys in, in into that. You know, you you and, and Lynn both both you know spoke, and so Absolutely. having them on the show and talking about that that's no big deal. And to me, it's no it's it's no different than if I make a friend and for for six months I'm the only person ever calling him and asking him if he wants to go out for a drink or ask him to play darts or something, and he never ever asks me. Eventually, I'm going to get the message, right? I mean, it's like it's, it's not rocket science. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, and Gary, this is new for Gary. So Gary will be interested, interested in hearing this. Okay. The reason why, okay. I've had a lot of authors over the years come up to me and say, how come you haven't read my book? Did you read my book? No, no. And, and my, and they'll say, well, how are you going to interview me? Well, we're talking about a subject that I know a lot of stuff about. Okay. Number two, I'm a professional. I am a professional. Okay. But number three, it's not my job to sell your book. This isn't a two and a half hour infomercial for me getting you on the air to talk about your book. I will mention your book. We'll tell people where to get your latest book. But as for me promoting your book in a two and a half hour infomercial or a two hour infomercial on the weekends, not going to happen. You take the crypto guru tonight. Perfect example. 
I have read zero of his books. Zero. It's not my job. Right? Our listeners don't want a two-hour infomercial of the author saying, well, you're going to have to buy my book to find out. You're going to have to buy my book to find out. Oh, I can't say too much because I don't want to give uh, give it away. Hey, hey, monk, don't you bitch about me. I, I gave you beer, free kokanee beer, and you drank it all way too quick. But that's your fault. <coughs> um, but that that's the same example, John. Okay. Guru knows that I will promote all of his books. I'll say, I'll tell our listeners because I trust the man. I trust the author. All right. But I don't have time to read books, number one. Number two, do I study on the author? Absolutely. You have to. You have to. No, and I think this is a lot of this is 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 about it's also about just the the semantics of a of a daily show, you know. I mean, you take someone like George Knapp, right? George Knapp does you know one or two shows on the weekend, like two or three weeks a month, right? So it's much easier for him to you know read an author's book, you know, like and then and they book so far in advance, right? It's like he he probably has three months to read the book, right? And 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 in, and then you know interview you know using that as a source, but you know he he's only you know talking to one or two people a week. It's it's a, it's a very different scenario. Well, okay, if people knew behind the scenes of Coast to Coast, and trust me, George Nori and George Knapp are two of my idols. I've met both of them. I think the world of both of them. Okay, Love. but one of the hidden secrets behind Coast to Coast is they ask all authors to prepare twenty-five questions to submit 25 questions that they would like to be asked. We do zero. Yep. Zero. And that is a mandate by me. Because even Gary, a couple, a couple of days ago, yeah. said, well, do you want us to ask, uh, ask for a few questions from the, from the authors? I said, absolutely not. Well, no, but, but what if you just leave it open to them and say, look, you, you're not, you're not, you don't have to submit any questions, but if there is material in the book that you, you really are proud of and you would like me to ask you about, you can supply a couple questions that would drive me to that, to that, to that information. I mean, is that, is that, is that also out of, out of what you're looking for? But then we're getting into, then we're getting into infomercial time. Mm-hmm. Right. Hmm. A lot of times, see, this is where a, what we do, and I don't know if other shows do this. What we do is whether it's Lynn or whether it's myself or Gary going into Saturday night hosting tomorrow night for Lynn. Okay. What we are doing is we are, we are um, calling the guest a few hours before showtime and talking to them about what we want to do on the show. Where do we want to go? So there is a game plan in place for each show. Now, somebody like the guru, I've interviewed him 35, 40, 50 times already. I don't right. need that phone call. Yep. Okay. Yep. I don't need that phone yep. call. And and that's a very professional, you know, standard thing to do. I mean, to me, one of the one of the quote unquote secrets, if you want to call it that, of Joe Rogan is that he, you know, he always flies the guest out and they go out for a long dinner the night before. And so, yeah. you know, that's where he establishes trust. That's where he 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 builds his credibility with them. And so now when they come into the studio to record the episode, it it's it's like they're friends, right? Because you know, they had you know a two hour dinner with two hours of drinks afterwards and talked all night, you know? No, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, and that's kind of the way, that's kind of the way it goes. And, and, uh, you know, one of those things that we need to be able to figure out is where do you find that happy medium, that balance, you know? So as far as ufology is concerned, you know, I realize people will translate that out there, you know, and I had, a, like I said, I had a few people comment to me, are you really leaving ufology? No, I never said I was leaving ufology. We're going to, I even said on the, on the show last night, we're not leaving ufology. We're still going to cover the topic. We yeah. have to. 
Okay. We may focus more on the experiencers, but the day-to-day BS that we see in this field, I don't think that, you know, like breaking news, we'll do it. We'll do it. But but the thing is, is that for me, for me, the the the, the message to the to the to the listeners, right? The, I mean, like like you know, there, there's all this you know side of, of of you know the business side of the house. But the the message to the listeners is is look, this whole time you've been seeing you know two different sides of SOR. You've been seeing the the canned stuff that you get on every other show, right? which can still be interesting because each interviewer takes a different approach. And so it might be worth it to watch Elizondo get interviewed three times by three different people. But let's face it, Elizondo, all these guys, they do a tour. So that's the canned approach. And then there's the other aspect of SOR, which is you guys, we bring on some really interesting guests that no one's ever talked to you before. You know, we, you know, they find, I mean, the people you have, I mean, oh my God, some of the guests you find are astounding. Right. Well, yeah, and that's, that's the unique that. stuff. Right. That's, and that's the stuff that stays and that's the stuff that gets better. Well, Gary, that's 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 not going to stop. Right. And, and I have to iterate on what Dave was saying, you know, when when he's just done kind of like I've done, uh, we're not leaving the UFO world. We're just stepping away from the dramatic community for a little right. well, that, No, I mean, that's what I was trying to say is that before you had these two sides of it, you had the canned stuff that you get everywhere yeah. else. And then you had the, the SOR unique stuff. And all I think all we're saying is that the can stuff is going to become less of a priority, and the unique SOR stuff is going to be, you know, even more front and center than it's already been. And to, yeah. to me, to the end user, to the to the customers, to the listeners, that's all goodness. I'm going to give another example of where I came down with this decision. Okay, <clears throat> we recently did a show on. Um, oh my goodness. I had the panel when Paul Hellyer passed away. We immediately reacted. We dropped Barbara Lamb that night, and I brought on a panel of very distinguished guests to talk about the legacy of Paul Hellyer. That was cool. Okay. I like that. We got rave reviews over it. So I'm kind of snoopy at times, and I go on social media and to some of the people that were on there. None of our guests shared that show. Yet a couple days later, a couple of members from our panel were on a different podcast. And they shared that show all over social media. Huh. Okay. Now, yeah. I was talking to somebody in Toronto about this, somebody who I know and trust who's been in the UFO world for a long, long time. And I was talking to her about it. And I said, you know, it's not that these people don't like us because if they didn't like us, they wouldn't come on the air. All right. And they like me. They like the show. They like our audience. All right. But that doesn't turn over to sharing their stuff, our stuff. And that's what we're trying to figure out. That's where it's frustrating for me when I see, you know, I see our audience who probably our audience in our chat room alone probably gets more listeners than this other podcast. No offense to that other podcast. And that show is being shown around Yet one like ours, where we have a power three-hour show on this topic. We even skipped the news that night to do the topic, and they don't share it. They all knew how to share it. They all knew where the link was. So to some, that may sound really babyish. Okay? From a business point of view, you're kind of like, what else can I do? What else can I do for respect? What else can I do to, to get things going? Well, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because, because I'm, I'm, I'm having to kind of reflect personally and, and think back to, you know, times that, that, that I have, I have shared this show or not shared this show times that I've shared other shows or not shared other shows. And 
And I'm just trying to think like, you know, what was my thought process? Cause I remember there being a couple of occurrences where, you know, where I thought of sharing someone else's show and then decided not to, or, or I thought of sharing your show and decided not to. And I'm trying to think of like what reasons there well, were when, when those times I decided not to. And I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, I, I don't, I don't remember anything specific, but I, I gotta, I gotta think on that because, because well, I, I think I, I agree with you that it's not, it's not like something that like is personal, but I also think it's, it's might be informative. Uh, no, true enough. But okay, this, uh, and John, you were in on the meeting and this is, this is where when we had our team meeting the other night, it was discussed that what we need is we need to make sure and we now have to make changes that Gary is going to implement about um, Gary is going to implement about um, making sure that the people we are bringing on the show, hit that follow button on Twitter, hit that follow button on Instagram. This is where you find the show afterwards if you would like to share it, okay? Providing the links where the show can be found. That's what we need to, you know, we may not have, you always before you blame anybody else, you have to look internally. Yeah. You have to look internally. And these these few incidents that have happened kind of behind the scenes have all of a sudden got the wheels going on what we need to do in order. Uh, God, Joe, Joe just killed my thought here. He says, I like Dave so much, I leave a bowl of water out of on my porch for him when he comes by. That is amazing. That is amazing. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. <laughs> But the point that I'm getting at is we have to figure out what are we doing different or what are we doing that isn't working that a podcast that gets maybe maybe 50 listeners is getting promoted by these people and a show that has, you know, thousands of views, not just on YouTube, but in the podcast form as well, okay, is literally not shared by the people who are on the show, right? So when we, what happens is when we, when we give, um, um, Sherry, that's a difficult question to ask. Did you call them on it? Um, no, no. I, I tend to grind my teeth a little bit and, and a lot at times probably for the for the wrong but these there's a lot of people where if I if I the way I my brain thinks is if I went and did that that they would see be like really really you're asking me this and you don't want to hurt someone's feelings that they may not come on the show again it sounds childish it sounds wimpy but that when you're doing those type, these types of shows, you don't want to burn that bridge. Not that we're trying to burn it right now by talking about it, right? This is just, this is just discussion. You know, there's, there's a number of little instances like that. Like I said, that over the years, you grow very tired of it. It's like, you know, the old cliche, you get Nick, you, you know, you your car start after the warranty breaks down, your car starts to nickel and dime you for repairs. And finally, you get sick of those nickel and dimes, and they all because they've added up to a lot of money. And eventually, you just say, "Enough is enough," right? And so, we're because of that, we've had to make, uh, uh, we've had to make some changes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it just comes down to just putting your energy where you're gonna, where, where you know, where it's gonna, it's gonna result in something, you know. Yeah. Um, the game is always changing. The game is always changing. And, you know, this is what we discuss, you know, Gary, myself, Lynn, and even you've been in some of those discussions, John, where we just, we just discuss what's happening. YJ, uh, I am going to be switching up the studio here soon. Uh, I am going to be uh, getting a, a green screen to go behind me. So you're not going to see this area anymore. This is going to be kind of like my area. 
and I just have to figure out how I'm going to put the studio in order to make it work for me. So I have to uh, order the green screen, and uh, then we're going to make it look a, a lot different. And it's going to look kind of cool. Well, Dave, you know, when you brought me on, we started this ball of rolling and it ended up like a snowball rolling down a British Columbia mountainside with about three foot of snow. It just started rolling and rolling and getting faster and faster. But I, I can answer all of the statements y'all made in the, made in the last 15 minutes about why you're leaving the community and uh, you're not leaving. You're just, you're taking a step back and reevaluate and then coming back in. Absolutely. Why all these other people are getting this and getting that and getting this. And I told you in private, but I'm going to say it in public. The reason they did is because they sold themselves, not sold out. They sold themselves. They presented themselves in a manner that caught attention with your personality. You, I'll put it bluntly. You don't kiss, butt. you do what you got to do and you go on. That's where they have excelled in areas that you haven't. Now you've got a team backing you that is going to help you without you know, I, I hear a, a crazy, you know, uh, uh, another individual saying sold out radio all the time. Uh, that's the last thing about spaced out radio. You're the last one to sell out. You know, I don't, I don't get that. I'm not in the UFO community. Y'all talk a bunch of stuff. I don't know when you talk about UFO community, but what I do know is business marketing and how to get people's attention. And these folks are doing it in different ways than you're doing it. So who's selling out? You know, uh, man, Gary, you know, I really think you hit something there because, um, you know, it's really funny. Like I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, but, you know, it, it's um, it, it's funny because, you know, like me personally, I, I prefer I generally prefer Dave's your Dave, your your style. Right. Um, you know, basically, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, nose to the grindstone, you know, it, it's, it's, it's straight up. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's actually, for me, it's, it's great for a daily show. It's, it's kind of what you want in a daily show. But, you know, if you look at some of the shows that have come out in the last, you know, last year or something, especially the ones that have kind of really, um, you know, uh, seen a huge increase. Uh, you know, there's a real, um, there's a showmanship. Mm -hmm. There's, um, there's, um, um, you know, there's a, there's a front man, um, on the stage sort of thing, you know, like, you know, you, you like, you look at the difference between like, you know, David Lee Roth and, and, um, and, and some other, uh, lead singers, right. I mean, uh, he, man, that, that he, 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 he couldn't stop selling it if he tried, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, that is, that is, that I, I think that is, that is, that is part of it. I really do. I, I think you're on this. I think you really hit something, Gary. I think, I think you're right. Well, and there's nothing wrong with, with doing that. No. Yeah. No, no, no. But it's just not Dave's style. Yeah, totally. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, you know, what it is guys is, is <laughs> look, not every show is for everybody. There are people who are going to be critics saying, I'm not rough enough on people. I'm not tough enough on people. Um, sometimes they're not listening properly to the way I ask questions. Gary said it probably best the other day when we were talking about how, uh, how I ask a lot of tough questions, but I, I use my polite Canadian kindness in order to get it in there and i kind of laughed at that because i never really realized it that way but yeah that's probably the way it is but i mean there you know i'm not worried about what other shows are doing i don't have time to tune into other shows i worry about what we're doing here and and that's where you know when when all of these nickel and dimes have added up it's grown some frustration um, you know, it's, uh, um, it's grown some head shaking. I, I remember talking to Lori and Fenton about it 
about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and she she started laughing on the phone. She goes, I was wondering when you were going to get here. Wait across the finish line, right? <laughs> and, and I told Lori in point blank, I, I said, uh, I, said I like her. <laughs> oh, I love Lori. I love Lori. Oh, I like her. You know, and that's funny. You know, <laughs> when I have hard questions I need to ask, I go to Lorian because she always seems to have an answer. But, you know, I don't listen to uh, what other people are doing. I don't pay attention. You know, you try not to pay attention to the criticisms. You try not to pay attention to, to uh, what other people are doing because you got to focus on what you were doing. I, where I go for, if I go look for advice or anything, I go uh, to other YouTube channels, see what they're doing, bigger YouTube channels. Uh, we've developed quite a friendship with Swamp Dweller, who is in our chat room again tonight. I look what he's doing. Okay, I'll go to his website. What do you have on the website that we don't have? Well, number one, you have a nice website. That's why we're rebuilding our website. <laughs> it loads properly. <laughs> yeah, that loads properly too. Look for that to be released very soon, folks. Not yes. say, but very uh, you know, and a website can lead to a lot of good things. A good website can lead to a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of new listeners, a lot of new followers and subscribers. And you know what? It is about there there's a couple things you have to balance. You have to be able to balance high quality entertainment high quality fun for your audience where they're either going to learn something or enjoy your company. And then number three, you have to worry about the numbers. Where are your numbers coming from? You know, play down the rumors of, you know, buying followers and stupidity like that. You know, that's all Gary's fault right there. <laughs> you know, be a rich man as many, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you, you have to play everything in fact. And what one of the things that we've shifted, I started to shift before Gary started, was I wanted to see what all of these bigger channels were doing. Okay. And I know there's much larger channels out there than, than the ones I chose, but I wanted to see what they were doing differently. I got some great advice from the guys from Third Phase of Moon. I got some great advice from the guys at Conflict Radio. I got some great advice from Swamp Dweller uh, in our in our chats. Um, now it's important too because I mean YouTube YouTube is a is a thing all into its own. And over the last you know ten years, a few people and it, it's actually not a loot. It's not a huge group. But it's a few people have really figured out how to how to how to play the game. And and it's paid off well for them, you know. I mean, not just in 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 in, in income for them, but in far as growing their channel into something really, really, really cool. You, know? you look at like Veritasium, right? I ran into one of Veritasium's like old videos from like ten years ago. Oh my god, it was it was, it was awful. And well, I mean, that guy produces beautiful content now. You know, I mean, there's a guy. Okay, so I I watch the other show, the other channels I watch. I watch um, Brian Shaw, former world strongest man. I watch his channel and uh, Eddie Hall. I watch a I watch Mr. Beast uh, because I mean, when you have sixty five million subscribers, you pay attention because obviously they're doing something right. I watch Chris Ramsey. He's a Canadian magician who solves puzzles. I remember um, when he was at 300. Oh, yeah, that's a cool show. I remember when he was at 330,000 subscribers. He's now encroaching on 5 million, right? Wow. This is, and so when, and when I brought Gary in to take care of the YouTube channel, that's where, you know, we went over all of these ideas. What is going to work? What is not going to work? Gary's a numbers guy. Gary likes statistics. He's weird that way. All right. And he he's had the ability to follow some trends and some patterns on what we're and watching a lot of YouTube videos on what works and what doesn't. And that's what we've been working on. Right. 
buying followers. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny how we're, I mean, Veritas actually did a funny episode the other day. Oh, which I, I sent to you guys where like, yeah. you know, he showed how he did this, he did this silly video of him on a bridge, taking a basketball and flipping yeah. it like reverse wise and looking at the physics of it going down. And he posted it and got like, you know, whatever, how many views someone else took his video and reposted it and changed the picture and the name and got 4 million views. <laughs> Absolutely. That was one of the most informative videos I've ever seen in my life. That was a yeah. oh, good. You watched it. Yeah. It was fascinating. Wasn't it? Where do you yeah. think a lot of these new ideas are coming from? <laughs> I, I was blown away by that. That, that just, video blew my mind. Just Absolutely. Like so, I, I mean, there's a lot for our audience. There's a lot that we, that we've talked about recently. Do we start a Twitch account? Do we not? Okay. Do we, you know, we have to find, because I know uh, Gary really hasn't looked into it yet. I don't understand it with Twitch. Twitch is uh, very popular with the younger generations. And Paula, who's in our chat room tonight, she's, uh, she watches us on Twitch almost every night. We have a few people on there that listen to us every night, but we're not doing enough on Twitch to get that, that boom yeah. that we've had on YouTube. Yeah. I don't care yeah. about TikTok. You know, uh, that one's driving me nuts. And, and, um, I haven't I figured that one out. Yeah. I haven't figured that one I mean, out. I, 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 TikTok I, I get, I just, I haven't figured out how, how it can be useful for for Absolutely. space Art radio our content is far too in depth and far yeah maybe doing little teasers or something but yeah it's the, it's hard the the thing with the twitch thing you know i've got a twitch channel I, I stream on twitch a lot when i'm just sitting around playing video games and stuff but uh you know when you get there you get there and you get there quick but you, you, like, you aren't doing there, minecraft are you gary no i don't play okay. <laughs> <laughs> well my He's wife in Minecraft. I'm uh, joking, man. I think Minecraft's great. I'm totally kidding. But getting your foot in the door, you know, finding that algorithm. And that's what this whole thing's about. This YouTube yeah. stuff is that algorithm. And yeah. and for some reason, we're doing something right. The greatest thing for me, and this is comes from the guests. This comes from and the, the folks out there listening. When I finally got Dave to responding on YouTube. I said, all right, dude, I'm going to take some of your load off of you, and I need you to start responding to the folks on YouTube. When that first time he responded, they responded back like, oh, my God, he's talking to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what it's about, that interaction. That, that breaks that fourth wall. You know, it, that, 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 uh, that, 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 it really, it, it makes it feel, it makes it feel so much more inclusive. It's, um, it's, you know, and it's, it's really, it's, I mean, the way it's playing out, it's really funny. Like, I love. I love how when guests come on and after they've been on for maybe half an hour or something, they'll, they'll, they'll say something with, with, with honest shock in their voice. Wow. Your, your guests are really nice. <laughs> you know? And it's like, and you can hear it. They're, they're really surprised. Right. Like it, it's, it's cool. You know? Um, I, I love how, like, you know, when there's a, there's a bunch of us that when we come on, everyone says hi to us, you know? It's it's really nice. It, you you feel really welcomed. You know, it's it's a cool little collective of people. It, it's it's there's something special there. I agree. Yeah, I think so. And you know, I look at it. Hey, what can we continue to do to advance the topic? Okay, like one of the topics we have talked about is adding a PR person. We're waiting to hear from. One potentially here coming up within the next few days. Okay. Things like that are going to help. Um, we've figured out. Did you ask the long sister? No. Oh. No. But, um, you know, it, it's little things like, like Spookles the cat adding a little reminder tweets that yep. you can listen to me on Monday through Friday yep. on Based Out Radio with the Times. And you yep. can listen to Lynn at certain times. Yep. All right. I mean, it's little things like that, that we're starting to do now. And this is all a lot of thought from Gary and Lynn. I give them a lot of credit for this on what can we do to bond this show? You know, cause we had a bunch of great pieces of paper put together, but we didn't have them in a binder. Gary's putting everything in a binder to make sure every end with, with folders in between, Okay, yep. to make sure we know A, B, C, D, 
E F G. Well, and that's the other reason why the website becomes so important is because, you know, the, 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 every business has a different angle of value to a website. And, you know, I remember there being a time where like a company called a website. Like, why do you have a website? But for, for a, a daily show like this, that's on at a certain time, the website is the anchor. That's where everyone goes when you're not broadcasting to yeah. find out what's going on, right? Like what's on tonight? What, you know, what was on last night? Is there any additional material? You know, is there anything going on? I mean, it's like, it becomes this anchor point that's really important. And, um, and you know, having that, having that like dialed in is going to be, it's going to be so nice. It's going to be so nice. Uh, who else showed up here? Uh, uh, Panther up. Piss. How you doing, buddy? I love that name. Panther Piss. That's that's a that's a that's quite a name. Great name. Now, now, Dave, are are have 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 you kind of covered what you wanted to cover? Because I have a question for you. Yeah, fire away. Okay, so one of the things that 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 I, I've I've been really bugging me about the community and and Gary and I, and I I think your community behaves differently, and I want to I want to hear your your point of view as well. And one thing I've noticed with this community is, is that when when a new piece of information comes out, whether it be whatever, a document, a video, whatever, all you hear is what's wrong with it. All you hear is people shooting it down. What you almost never hear is anyone standing up for it, right? What tends to happen is the, the people that believe in the content stay quiet. Right. And the people that are against the content speak up in volumes. And occasionally, once things get enough momentum, you'll have people that push back a little bit. You know, certainly when we get to like, you know, um, uh, you know, Bob Lazar, you know, there's people that, you know, will push back a little bit. But for the most part, there's no there's no counter to the negative. And what that means is because there's no one speaking positively about it, there's no one there's no one championing it. You never get. Um, you never reach consensus, right? Like there's there's no data in the in the UFO community where where there's actually been a consensus decision made that that we all agree something is is valid or we all agree something's not valid, and that's weird to me. Like that's not like I mean I'm not saying that you get complete uniformity, but in most organizations that I have dealt with, you get to a point where 80% of the people uh, are, are willing to agree something is so, and you still get you know uh, maybe 20% that, that grumble about it, but they go along with it for the good of the of the of the organization, right? And uh, and so all I see in in this community is either uh, something gets shot full of holes, or you never hear it about again. Like the stuff that, that doesn't get shot at just disappears into the vapor. Like, like that, no one talks about it anymore. Like that seems to be the stuff that actually is valid because no one shoots at it, but still no one actually speaks up for it. The Wilson documents being the one exception where you had um, Dolan and you had um, a couple other people say, uh, you know, I, I'm, I know for a fact this is valid, right? That was, that was kind of an outlier. But my question to you, Dave, is it, is it, one, do you mean do you agree? I mean, is that how you see it as well? And then, I, and I then I'm curious as to how how like what what just how what what are your thoughts on it? Because it really bugs me. Well, I think it's easy to focus on the negative because there's so much out there. Whether you disagree with someone's research, you disagree with someone's position, or, or you disagree with someone's career, the way they look, the way that they talk. Uh, the information that they provide. Look, we do it too. Look how I banned the word squatch on the show. We do it too. Bring it up. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But every community is like that because I think the biggest reason why is because there is no modicum of a rule book or a governing body that is looking after these subjects. It is anarchic in a way you know where if you take the bigfoot community <clears throat> push the ufo community aside for a second and you take the bigfoot community and you know you have the monkey people you have the the gigantopithecus people you have the wild man people you have the people who believe that sasquatch are a people and need voting rights 
You have the interdimensional people. You have the, the shape-shifting people. You have the First Nations people. You have, you have everything. Uh, and because we are not, and this is where it always comes down to, John, where in the Bigfoot and paranormal communities especially, and Gary, please correct me if I'm wrong, okay, because we have people conducting opinion on site, we don't have people conducting science. We have people conducting opinion. That's where that area, those areas in those fields get, get real ugly. Yeah. The UFO community gets ugly because we're tired of anecdotal stories like my own, like anybody else's who have had weird, creepy encounters. Doesn't matter whether it's Chris Bledsoe, Samantha Mowat, or anybody in our chat room. We're tired of those stories. We know the governments are holding a bunch of secrets on this. We know that they are controlling a narrative of what they're giving us, okay, and what we're allowed to talk about. We have a divided community where you have people who, the old crowd, who is still trying to remain extremely relevant after some of them have been researching for 50 plus years. You have the new crowd that is bought right into um, the the fact that the old guard doesn't care about them. Uh, Dave Squatch, I hate Canadians. Squatch on, go squatch yourself. What you squatching, squatching? <laughs> I, I think the only people in the world that don't like Canadians are the, maybe the people in Quebec. Uh, uh, <clears throat> pretty much, but that's where. That's where but the Gary, sides are different. In your world, and I agree, but but that's the thing is that in your world, like like for example, there was that video that came out uh, a while ago. It was um it was of a of something crossing a river, and it looked like it was it was holding something, like it was holding an infant or it was holding something, right? And uh, and it was really interesting because that came out, and then like something else came out, and. And it's really funny. I showed them to my daughter. You know, she, she's five, right? And I didn't say anything to her. All, all I said, I showed her the video, and I, and I said, you know, honey, just curious, just ballpark. Like, what do you think that is, right? And uh, and she called it better than I did, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but um, but you know, but basically, what seems to happen in your world, Gary, is is that um, it takes a couple weeks, but usually a couple weeks after a video comes out. Like, I, I, I get, I hear some word whether it's valid or not. Like, it, there, there does seem to be some consensus that occurs in well, your community not, that that evidence. something's passed or failed. It, it's not a consensus because there's no <laughs> governing body. It's once again, it's all a matter of opinion. But what ends up happening? The best way that I could describe my community. I mean, I'm not in the UFO community, but I agree with Dave that there is a little bit of scientific, and there's some scientific knowledge in my community. Don't take me wrong; there's some very smart individuals out here. But it's almost like you know, you remember back in the uh, in the Germanic and warring tribes of Europe. You know, you had all these different factions all saying that they're right and they're wrong, and and I sure, hate sure. That way. It, it, it's a lot like the primitive, not the primitive church, but the early church in the American Feudal, yeah, feudalism. Yeah, yeah, totally. But the thing yeah. is like, you take that video of the people of that, of that person walking across the river, right? Like what I heard was that that was, that was determined not to be a Bigfoot. That was determined to be something else. Right now. Like, is that video going to continue to get it brought up every five years for the next 20 years? What like that, that video is going to die away, right? Because they all decided it's not good, right? Just like that picture I sent you the night before last. Yeah. That was brought to my attention six years ago. And to me, it's one of the most legitimate pictures I've ever seen. Well, it just popped up just a few weeks ago on a certain Bigfoot forum uh, out of Washington state. And the lady claimed it was hers and I'm, and it was taken in Oregon. And I'm like, it was told me yeah. six years ago, it was taken in Oklahoma. I heard a year oh, before that it was taken in Florida. You know, it, what it is, is they, like they rug it, they run it under a rug or throw it in a closet and hide it a little bit. And then they bring it out later and it's, Oh, it's fresh. 
I don't see that in the in the UFO community. In the UFO community, we are still analyzing stuff from the 40s and 50s. The only thing in the Bigfoot community that's that's hit steadfast for the last 40, 50 years is the Roger Patterson Gimlis myth. Well, I mean, yeah. there was that video recently out of Idaho. Yes. Yeah, we're still waiting to hear on that, right? I mean, well, that, that looks well, that looked real really interesting. I've stories on that, but to me, the mass of that individual that creature looks real to me. Yeah, the arms I, are a little I, bit short, but the I it, still want to find out why the video is so short. Um, you know, is is there a longer video and they just held it back because they want money for it, or is there did they actually only film three seconds? The, the the story that I've heard, and I, I haven't got any verification on it, that it was actually a film project for a bunch of college kids, and they actually produced it and faked it. But I'm telling you, and you would the three cents, right? Then you'd actually do like a full because it's part of your class project. You got to actually produce something to the show. Yeah. So, but as we all know, you can clip out video and make anything more dramatic. You know, true. I would, I would true. like to see fair. The, foreground and the background of it. but here, oh, yeah, yeah. here's the thing too uh, that we have to remember whether it's ufos ghosts or bigfoot dogman or whatever the reason why we're still very hyped up on on the patterson gimlin film is because is because there's so much fake and forgery that is going on these days that there are i mean there are people they don't want to see evidence anymore they're so tired of the fakes and forgeries that they're just not trusting anything unless it comes from them themselves. I had a ghost photo. I think I have it here somewhere. Um, let me see if I got it here. Hold on. Um, right. No, that ain't it. Oh. I got it on here somewhere. Our nut bark. All right. Is that it? All right. There it is. Okay. I'm going to show you guys a photo here. Is that the one with the staircase? Yeah. Oh, don't be showing me no ghost photos this late at night. <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> okay. There's the there's the picture. I, I apologize. I, actually, I can make it a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's an interesting picture. It really is. It's an uh, interesting picture. No, that's not what I want. Sorry, you guys. Grab it at the bottom corner and drag it over, Dave. No, it doesn't do that. All it does is give me that stupid oh, white. Because of the, the border pixelization, yeah. Okay. All right. So there's the photo. Right really there. Interesting photo. This here, this here is a person. This here is a shadow of a person. Look at this guy. Yeah, it's really interesting. I would actually say female myself, wearing a like a maroon or a beige dress, a little girl with long hair. And, and like, I mean, I have so much trouble with this because I mean that that means that 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 object is is reflecting photons. It is reflecting light, like the person. That hey, is really troublesome. <laughs> my question is, who took the picture? What's the backstory of the experiences in the area? And what's the fourth story? All right. The story of this, of this is, this was taken by a retired school teacher on our ghost tour. All right. It was taken by a phone uh, when we did the ghost tour at the museum, we made sure that our guests have every opportunity of taking photos. All right. Um, this photo was taken of this ghost here. Um, by this teacher on a Samsung galaxy phone. There was nobody on the stairwell when that photo was taken because we didn't allow people to go up here where there's a catwalk beyond this, beyond this, uh, uh, okay. Thing here. 
Okay, but here's here's my question. This is where my paranormal investigator side comes. Mm -hmm. Location prior history of hauntings? Yes. Okay, is the location directly in correlation with you? No, I was not in the building at this time. Do you know the building? Are you tied to this photo? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, three so things the photo is green. <laughs> that the photo thing, is go ahead. Sorry. No, please. You go ahead. That fa and I'm I'm just telling you that face to me is definitely three dimensional. You can see hair coming down in the middle of the forehead, in between the eyes, a lock of hair. You see hair on either side. Of course, I've got a big, you know, fancy, and you can see physical. Whatever it is, it's three dimensional because you can see the hand laying on the baluster. On yeah, the you know it's going to be you know it's going to be really interesting, guys. Is I don't know if you're aware of this, but the the recent, the recent iPhones way. have have L, have have lidar. Yeah, and um and some of the um some of the archaeology websites have started um when they go on trips, uh, specifically Uncharted X has started doing um lidar scans of 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 places like in like, you know, um, uh, Egypt and so forth of doing a LIDAR scan of, of a set of stones that he finds interesting so that he can show it on his show. And then he actually lets you download the, the image file so you can actually render it yourself and look at it. Once people start catching LIDAR of this sort of event, mm -hmm. then things are actually going to get very, very interesting. Because then you're actually going to be able to walk up to that thing and take a look at it and, and look at the sides of it. One thing that gets me about this is the anomaly is actually better quality than the physical human being standing. Yeah, up. totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Agreed. This photo, a little bit, a little bit more information about this photo. The lady who took it was in this group. She came on the tour with her friend because her friend was really into the ghost hunting television shows. This lady had zero interest in anything paranormal or supernatural. Didn't believe in any of this stuff until she caught this photo. Okay. okay. And, and this really tripped her out. Really, really tripped her out. And this, this one here, I had people in the paranormal community call this uh, photo faked said that there was a mannequin on the stairs, a person on the stairs. It's an owl, um, MUFON's top person. Uh, him and I got into an argument about it because um, he didn't think I was qualified enough to support the photo. Interesting. And um, him and I went back and forth on Facebook. <clears throat> And uh, so, I mean, here's a, a clean photo of something that we want to catch. This is, this is a, a top-notch photo of a ghost that we want to catch. This is what everybody uh, wants to, to uh, try and get in their paranormal lives, and it gets ripped apart. It gets absolutely ripped apart. That happens in all of the communities. That Absolutely, you know, and and the main and the main reason why, the main reason why it gets ripped apart, is because everything has been faked so much that no matter what you put out there, people are not going to believe it. I had some very good professionals look over that photo, and they all confirmed that we got a ghost very big name professionals who have the equipment to do what you guys are talking about. I don't know that kind of gear, but I send it to people whom I trust. And I would still get these two bit paranormal teams and paranormal people coming up to me saying, I'm the only one who could decipher whether or not this is real. Send me the original. And I'd be like, no. Well, then you're lying. How am I lying? Wow. Right? And they go on attack mode. So, I mean, a, a photo like that, does it deserve uh, scrutiny? Of course it does. Of course it does. But don't right. sit there. You're not there. Tell me that it's a mannequin. When I have eight people on the tour 
in that yeah. group who say there was nobody on the stairwell. Absolutely. Okay. You know, in my 25 years of research, Dave, me and you talked about this in private. When I finally come to the point, you know, when I had my face to face and realized exactly what I was dealing with, and I made the decision to quit trying to prove the existence thereof to everybody else, my life got a whole lot simpler. Mm -hmm. And and I love how you say that. You're an experiencer. Mm -hmm. People like to rip it apart. I want to I want to show this uh, comment here from Excaliperful. A lot of this is because the community doesn't punish those who repeatedly publish or contribute to fake photos, videos. Instead, those people get the most views on social media. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. And, and you know, it's funny because this is where, you know, going back to why I'm leaving UFOs, okay, or the, or the not leaving UFOs, but I'm disliking the UFO community is because everybody in this field is a yeah, but person. Yeah, but this person is nice. Yeah, but this person's young. Yeah, but this person has had experiences. Yeah, but this. Yeah, but that. That's true. I'm done with the yeah, buts. When that certain channel, okay, I'm not going to mention the names, but there's a channel out there who stole four minutes, four and a half minutes of one of my interviews and put it on his own channel that is monetized. And when I struck him on a YouTube copyright infringement, this person went all over YouTube or all over Twitter and was calling me out as an a-hole. You know, the, the one question I, I had about that a while ago is, is it, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Finish, please. Okay. I had experienced people in this field whom I know, trust, and respect calling me up, ripping me a new one for being a an, an a-hole because I struck, copyright struck his YouTube channel and which a video which he had monetized of mine. Now it's only four and a half minutes. People will say, well, it's only four and a half minutes. What are you what are you griping about? Could That's have a whole song. Me. Could have asked me. Right? YouTube standards, if it's over nine seconds, it's <clears> right. <throat> right. So I mean, the point that I'm getting at is this. This person made me look like an asshole in front of some very good people that I respected. All right. And I still pay the price for that. There's one individual out there who's very well known. He won't return any of my messages or calls because he's tied to this person now. Okay. And people want his initials RD. Okay. So when you look at when you look at everything that goes on, all right, we're all just trying to eat our own. There are many, I shouldn't say we're all, there are many out there who are trying to eat our own and they get a free pass. Just like I took a lot of heat when I started calling out the fake journalists in the field. People who lied about their credentials. Yeah, but this person is a nice guy. Yeah, but this person uh, isn't doing any harm. Yeah, but, you know, they did write a blog, not journalism. Okay not journalism. And I took heat for that from a lot of people, dude. A lot of people. UFO Twitter was all over me. The minute I opened my mouth, they were all over me. No, and, and I have to admit, and I, I said this before, I, I initially, I was, I, I, I didn't like it either because to be very, very honest with you, I'm, I'm totally embarrassed to be saying this, but I honestly didn't know that there was like a, I, I like I didn't know there was like an official journalism thing, you know, like a like a like a certificate or something. I didn't know. I, just, you know, I, I didn't know. And so <laughs> say again, you can get a degree in journalism. Well, I, yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I, I figured, you, you know, you, there, was, there was some kind of a literature specialization in journalism or something like that. But it's like, you know, I mean, I didn't I didn't. Um, I, it, it's hard for me because I, I live in a, I, I, I live in an area of, of, of where. Um, you know, like 
you don't really have to have a degree to do anything here. Uh, the one exception being doctors. That's pretty much it, right? Um, you know, everything else, a degree is nice. It's great if you have one, but you don't need one, right? Look, and so, I've been, so I've been a lot of journalists over the years who never went to journalism school, but they got a break. Okay. They learned they mentored. From the bottom up. They just didn't invent a title. There's one right. person, there's one person out there. I can tell you right now in 2019, this person who lied about their credentials and thank goodness this person doesn't do it anymore. Okay. But I'm going to use this person as an example, lied about his credentials of uh, being a UFO journalist. Never, ever worked in a newsroom, never been a journalist in his life. Okay. Everything he went on, every podcast he went on, every YouTube channel he went on, when, when, he, when he would speak at a conference, he would let everybody know, I'm a UFO journalist. Well, first off, wow. there's no such thing as a UFO journalist. Okay? <laughs> number two, not number, number two, okay, in 2019, this person who lied about their credentials who does not anymore that I've noticed spoke at nine different conferences across North America wow. and got a television show as a journalist. He was promoted wow. on that television show as an investigative journalist. You know why Dave? Wow. Because he sold himself. Very well. Absolutely. That's true. He, he marketed it himself perfectly. Absolutely. Okay? Number one, he marketed himself perfectly, which was great for him. But when you talk about the problems in the field, anybody can be anything in this field. John, you know there is a fake scientist in this field that promotes himself as a real quantum physics scientist. And the only thing that that ever came out was he took a four week beginner's course on quantum physics. Yep, I, I have significantly more units at, at at an accredited university at Stanford of all places in quantum physics than he does, and uh, I, I would never dream of calling yeah. myself a quantum physicist. But he's calling himself a quantum physicist. Yeah, I know. Okay, I know. You have people who can make up anything that they want in this field. Television show host. That's another one we see. You got a YouTube channel. You're not a television show host. <laughs> radio journalist. Okay, here's one that picks my ass. That I don't I don't say much because I'm an old radio guy. When I hear people say they're speaking on the radio and they're doing a Facebook live or they're doing a YouTube oh. thing, you're not on the radio. Right? Yeah, that's true. Radio show. Picks my ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Now, that's if they're a on point. a now, the the difference is if they're on a digital radio network, sure, but call it digital radio. I do. I tell you point blank, our listeners every night, you can listen to us on terrestrial or on our terrestrial affiliates or digitally on Talkstream Live Revolution Radio and KP. Yeah. yeah, 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 and that's a good distinction. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah, no, agreed, agreed. right, agreed. Yeah, I'm no, I totally agree. Broke my heart. Yes. What's again? I'm still upset. Dave broke my heart yesterday. Why? I, I got all my my texts and everything ready for tomorrow night show and stuff, and I was like, I'm finally making it into the big time. I'm getting on terrestrial radio. Oh, but the Saturday is not. <laughs> not terrestrial radio. Broke my heart, man, because I'm. <laughs> I've always been Art Bell and a George Dory fan. I wanted to do the old terrestrial radio. Oh, I'm that is man. funny, dude. Ask Dave. I said, dude, no, Gary. Cool. Gary, I got to tell you something. Same thing happened to me, man. <laughs> Same thing happened to me. I I was on I was on with um with Michael was it Michael Hall I think I think yeah, yeah I think it was first on with him, and uh, and I was all and I was all excited and then I found out so the weekends are. <laughs> My, the whole deal of when me and Dave started this, and you know our our oh, path together, funny. which I, I I love every minute of it. I he asked me to help him out. I said for one thing, you teach me how. Oh yeah, it damn build straight. That, build that radio voice and to get that radio presence. And I'm oh, all yeah. here we are. You know, a few months. That's later, hilarious, man. 
we're just that is hilarious <laughs> that is awesome that is awesome that is awesome okay so now the the, the other question that the kind of follow up to my to my question is is it is it is one it, of the things i, I discovered in, in my research is that um there's a collection of photos that were taken a long time ago that were done with old style 35 millimeter cameras long before you know digital anything was available and there's a couple researchers on Cora, for example, that will whip out these collection of photos as what they consider to be the predominant photos of UFOs that, that we have that have never been debunked. OK, and they, they argue that the, the reason why they haven't been debunked essentially is because they're taken in old style you know film and they can't be modified yes. right yes you can't it's hard to modify it yes and uh and and, and I, I i i grabbed a bunch of them right and um and th these photos man they're insane yeah. i mean like they are absolutely i mean I, I i don't know if i can can i share my screen am i allowed to do that yeah let's see let's try let's see if this works here uh share screen uh no i'm not gonna build two two monitors too bad uh okay all right uh let's see here uh oh i can do a window all right cool I'll do a window good all right okay so can you guys see that yeah all right cool so let me just grab like one of them like here this one look at that i mean that is an insane photo i mean I, I'm just and so my, my question is is that it in in your world I mean in this world Dave like are are and I know I'm sure some of these photos people disagree with but I mean are 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 these photos all considered to be like locked in like everyone agrees that they're legitimate because like some of these photos are 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 they're absolutely astounding and like I don't even know if people are aware they exist. I mean, I'm blown away by some of these. And according to the researchers that I talked to, these are all photos that have been analyzed over and over and over again. They're all original 35 millimeter film. There's, I mean, a couple of them are, let me see if I can find like the really old one. Um, a couple of them are like, are, are really old. I mean, like, I mean, like, like black and white. Um, where is it? Is it this one here? Yeah, look at that one. 1927 i mean like these these are these are way more like detailed than anything we've gotten i mean everyone's asking for a photo of this triangle coming out of the out of the ocean saying you know it's going to be such a big deal and some of these photos are i mean look at that that looks I, like a hubcap to me i agree with you I totally agree with you. Like that one's really hard to believe. But what I guess my question is is it is is there a collection of photos that everyone does agree on? No. Okay. Uh, here, I, go back to the other ones. I could uh, I'll tell you what the critics will say. Pick okay, one. Okay. Okay, like this one. That one, hubcap with holes drilled in it and lights put in it. Hanging by a wire to the top of the tree, and so there is no, there is no, or like, like I mean, this one. I mean, that's an old photo. Okay, uh, with today's camera settings, you can make it look old, and that was digitally pressed onto a photo and then taken out of a book. Okay, but if if they actually have if they actually have like a chain of custody for the photo and they can prove it was taken when it was taken. Yeah. But you have to realize the critics and the skeptics don't care about that. Yep. Okay. T take, take the, the one with the orange orb, the, the that one there. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, this one okay. here. No, not, I'm sorry. Not that one. Okay. That one could be a hubcap. Being flown yeah. like a frisbee the through the air. Orb actually looks like clouds in front of the sun. This, one, that's, was, this one was interesting. Okay, that one there, uh, a hot coal being thrown in the air. This one supposedly was taken over a volcano. Um, yeah. 
I don't remember where though. Um, okay. But anyway, I was just, I was just kind of, I, I was, the, this guy showed these photos and I was just, I was blown away and I felt, um, I don't know. I was, I, 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 I was kind of irritated because I was like, man, like yeah. some people are like begging for all these photos and they exist. No, I, and I agree. I, I agree with you. But the fact is there are people out there where their whole job is to debunk this, whether they're bought by government plants or, or agencies or whatever, or whether they're just hardcore podcasters who try to debunk everything. There are those out there who are, who are going to um, like, give me an example, go back to that black triangle for a second. Yeah. Okay. There are people who will zoom in on that and say, okay, that looks like a pair of eyes. That looks like a, uh, a smiley face on the bottom that a child drew. That could be a paper airplane. If you look at the tips, they look like they're bent up. Okay. On the, on mm -hmm. the, uh, on the one end, not by the uh, two white lights, but on the other end, mm -hmm. it looks like the two tips are bent up. That to to the skeptic, they're going to say that's a pa uh, uh, a paper airplane with child's drawings on the uh, of a face on the on the bottom of it. Because look, you'll see see the uh, bottom parts of the wings are folded up. Okay, so so basically, the, the old thirty five millimeter film stuff is not considered to be safe. Then, yeah, but people will still tear it apart. People will still tear it apart. That's that's the i the idea that of the community we are in right now. I mean, look at that. 1932. Right. That's unfortunately yeah. the community we're in right now is they've been hoaxed so many times. Right. I don't care if it's taken in 1932 or 2021. They are just done with it. Okay. Dave, yeah, watch enough with the satanic Mossad stuff. We don't do politics. We don't do religion. We don't do that stuff in our chat room, dude. I don't. Oh I don't God. mind if you want to be snarky in there or anything like that. Okay, but if you're going to start bringing up uh, that kind of stuff, we don't want it here, dude. Okay. Well, that makes me feel better, Dave, because because I because I I was thinking that there was there was two different um, two different um, criteria being applied to to evidence. That you know there was this older set that had been somehow approved, and you know, and there was a newer set that you know that were basically being uh, had more scrutiny applied to them than 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 um, than than what we were seeing now. So so the fact that this that, that all of these would be shot out in the same way that that actually that, that actually makes me feel better. So so thank you, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, look, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk here for you, my friend. I'm not trying to be... No, I, I really wanted to know. No, totally, totally. I, I never want to be that guy. But, I mean, if I look at this from... Yeah, there he goes. You're a shill, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave Squatch. Appreciate you. That's a real nice compliment. Thanks, Duke, for taking care of that. Yeah. <laughs> Right. You know, I love these people who come into your chat room and the first thing they do is start getting snarky with you. And I try to be nice at the beginning to kind of warm them up and let them in and see if they get comfortable in the chat room. But when you start dropping some of the crap, don't need that here. Well, I think some people, they, they, they've they been out drinking or they've been out with friends and they get home oh, yeah. and they, they, they you know, they, they park on the couch and then they can't go to sleep yet. And so they whip out their laptop and start shooting at people online. I mean, I really think that's how people play it sometimes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's a shield? <laughs> <laughs> that's an insult, buddy. You're a shield. Uh, what would be a good definition of a show? Um, let's Google it and see what it is. Like it's funny because like I I I I feel I know it, but I have a hard time putting a it in words. Thing? <laughs> it, it basically, if someone said to you like you're a government shill, it basically means you're you know you're 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 you're, you're acting on behalf of the government like in a sneaky and nasty way. One who acts as a decoy. Yeah, there you go. One who makes a sales pitch or serves as a promoter. 
I would say Dave Scott's a salesman. He sells spaced out radio pretty good. I, oh, wait. I, I must not be that good of a salesperson if I'm getting you to buy followers. That's what I was fixing to say. I, 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 if we're sold out radio, did I have to sell out to buy? Hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, well, I mean, it basically means that, you know, everyone who who, who participates are, are putting their reputations at risk as well, you know, because, I mean, it, it's obviously a very, you know, um, you know, shady group of people. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. I'm going to go to the bottom of the hour, guys. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So, so, so Dave, is there <laughs> anything, is there anything in the UFO community world? Is there any piece of data at all that like the majority of people, it doesn't have to be everybody, but the majority of people have like have blessed. I would say the majority would be the three, the three UFO videos from the Navy. Okay. okay. But nothing before Please. that. The 2004 video, the tick hey, turbines. How you doing, man? Which which three yeah, videos are you talking the about? Three, the, three Navy, the three Navy videos. The three so Navy videos. Pack, the, the gimbal and fast and the fast. gimbal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, dude. you know, that in itself shows how important those videos are. If those really are the, the, the most agreed upon pieces of evidence, that, yeah. That that really puts them into I, a different I, category. From a public standpoint from a from a uh, <clears throat> the majority of the UFO field, I would say those three videos, as ugly as they are, are probably the three most credible that we could go by. Only because if you trust what the government says that they those are unidentified aerial phenomena, that's what we need to go by. But John, you could have five triangles hovering at a hundred feet over top of your house in midday. And you could grab a 15 minute tape on this where they all shoot into the sky in a split second. They're not going to believe you. See, this is the, this is a problem. I mean, this is a, this, this is a I was given. I was given a, a video of a Bigfoot. I'm not going to say how I got it. I was just promised that I would never, ever, ever release it. And unfortunately, it got killed when my Facebook, my original Facebook profile uh, was banished by Facebook. <gasps> okay. And I could probably get it back. But this Sasquatch video, to me, was the next best thing next to Patterson Gimlin. And I could not, I couldn't release it because of where it came from. And I'm not going to say where it came from. Okay. Uh, and it was phenomenal. Wow. Phenomenal. You see this, this big hulking thing in the forest uh, from a helicopter's perspective, running through, looking up at the helicopter. You see it jump probably 15, 20 feet. It was, it was about a minute long, this video. And like I said, I can't say who I got it from. I can't say wow. where it came from. Nothing. All right. But this video, I could tell you point blank, was the next best thing to the Patterson Gimlin that I have ever seen. And <clears throat> that video, the chances of it ever coming out are, it, I would say it may come out and, in 10 years, maybe 15. All right. Wow. Well, and you know, I have, I, not, I have a hard time. I have to admit, admit because, you know, not, not I'm sort of paying more attention to this whole uh, big foot cryptid side of the world. Um, like to me, there's no risk in for the, for the, okay. Whoever, okay. Let, we're, we're going to assume that, that, that UFOs are real. And, and for the sake of this conversation, we're going to assume that those real UFOs have pilots and that those pilots are not from Earth. OK, we're just going to we'll run with that assumption for a second. I'm not worried about their health. Right. 
Uh, I'm not worried that the information that I help get out about UFOs and make it public is going to put them in jeopardy. I, I have a lot of faith that they can take care of themselves. Okay. Um, I, I, I really worry about the Bigfoot side of things, because if it, if we make the same assumptions that, that, that there is a real creature and that it it's alive and it eats and it has kids and it and it dreams and it has you know like it it's a real creature oh man i gotta be honest like i really i i don't i don't really know if that going public is a good thing or not okay well here's one okay here's one on facebook this is what we have to deal with all right this is a pure example of the bullshit we need to deal with all right Here's a, vi a photo on Facebook. Lady put up, says, my husband has been having some strange around activity around his feeder. Our camera got destroyed somehow, getting another today. Is it me or do you see something? When you zoom in there, you see branches. But it looks like uh, uh, legs doing a hee-haw kind of dance right here. All right? There's nothing there. And we are being told there's something there. This is ah. what this is where the BS starts. Okay, ah. this is where the BS starts. Or that's or, rotten. Or when or when you get someone who says, "I've got a great." I'm just going to go on this site here for a second. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. You're going to make me getting you don't get me in trouble again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to clip this out. <laughs> Do you see anything in that photo, Gary? Mm, well, as soon as I seen the black and the red, everybody knows if you got a circle at red and black, don't uh, don't send it to me because I'll I'll laugh at you, Duke. This one's for you, baby. He circles that stuff in red, and but what's funny is when we remove the red, I can see it <laughs> even before. <laughs> but Wait. no, that's the the the. the, the I don't, I'm not gonna say nothing bad about that group. I've been a member of that group. For no, no, I'm not. No, no. See, don't don't take it personally. I'm not slamming the group. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I, I don't see nothing but a bunch of trees. Okay. <laughs> not Sasquatch behavior. That. But I, I'm looking for something specific here for a second. So just bear with me. Maybe I'll find it in this group. This is the first one that popped up on my Facebook. So that's why I went to this one. Okay. Scroll back up the one on the right standing in the window. A great example. Keep going. Nope. That's literally a person. Nope. Uh, go back, blow it back out, and then go up two more rows. You'll see one with eye shine right there on the right. That is literally a clip from uh, Monster Quest. With <laughs> That is Interesting. a frame from a bald, guy from a bald squatch there. Yeah. We got bald squatch. But what I'm looking for is something different here. Um, okay. Okay. Something like this. This is a prime example. Blurry photo. Nothing there. Somebody has to put a red circle. I'm surprised they didn't put a circle right here as well. Okay, and they're selling this off as, uh, like the comments, a full-grown male, that a peeker out back. This is nothing. If you've been in nature, and I am the most amateur person in nature that there is, but I sure as hell know that when I'm driving on the gravel roads, a lot of bark looks like it's a bear. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Tree stumps look like a bear or a squatting Sasquatch, right? This is the crap that drives me nuts and drives the community nuts, okay? <clears throat> is that a UFO picture in a Bigfoot group? Might be. That huh. looks like an eclipse. Yeah. Hmm. Well, there, there's a weird angle to it, though. Yeah. Um... See if there's anything else. But let me, let me throw devil's advocate at you, though. There are a lot of folks that are highly motivated. And, Dave, this is where we have our private conversations about this. 
highly motivated and highly, highly, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, honest that don't know what the anomalies to look for. They're just, yeah, yeah, seeing, yeah, totally fair. They're, they're posting it as a question. Yes, this looks like a Sasquatch to me. And like John said, in the community, people rip them apart. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I agree with that. So instead of this is the attitude that me and, you know, Dave, me and you talked in public, I mean, private much, instead of ripping them apart, explain to them what they're seeing. Yeah. Exactly. And, and and then give them an example to prove your theory. Okay. But then that's when you get into the people that I don't like where well, you're just poo pooing on my stuff. You're, 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 you, you don't, you're not a believer. No, I'm not a believer. I'm a knower. Here, here's yeah. the caption on this one. This guy followed me while I was walking my dog last night. I've got a picture of a tree. The tree has legs, apparently. Well, and once again, I understand 99.9% .9 of the time, but there are some good photographs Duke's got. He's from. invisible. Duke oh. has great photographs. Duke has great photographs. Yeah. Okay. But what I'm saying, okay, is uh, this. This is a great example. Yes. People submitting this. This oh is. Oh, my goodness. Okay. What the hell is that? To supposed me, to that be? looks like somebody pixelated a photo of their dog. That Look, could be anything. I mean, that could be anything. The reason I ask for the original photo well, for a copy of the original and let me find that. That's the horrible. Right? Huh. <clears throat> or something like this. There's no body here. There's no body, but we're supposed to be looking at a some sort of head right here. Uh. Okay. This is what people are, and this is why, whether it's the Bigfoot community, the the uh, UFO community, all right, there. Okay. Now, that's you, actually interesting. That's interesting, but the fact is, give the original. Yeah, 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 100%. Give the original. Yeah. But there is actually some facial structure there and shoulders structure. But... If you look at it from a critic's point of view, yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's not, yeah, that, nothing conclusive. That's a tree stump. Sure. And okay. it could be. I mean, to now, me, here, I, 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 I don't think so, but it could like, be. I mean, who knows? Like, I look at something like this that looks like a cat face. Okay. But. I wasn't there. I don't know. Yeah. Right now, have you have you guys have you guys seen the the um, the hundred frames per second um, 4K um, uh, uh, upgrade of, of the give of the Gimlin film? Yeah, that's beautiful. Isn't that crazy? Even man, the the, the the structural biomechanical structural movement of the body is just oh. so. You you, oh. you take this photo. This is a nice, clean photo. Okay, you can see the structure. Of, this looks to be a back or a shoulder. There's the head. That could be an eye right there. Okay, but for a person who is not familiar with the subject, if I were to look like this, tree oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Tree totally. stuff. Because look at the totally. size of the trees here and here. Uh, this looks like second, second growth, not old growth. That's about the size of an old growth tree stump. If I wanted to be highly critical, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. No, I totally agree. Percent. That's the reason. Like you said, uh, you both have said you know multiple times tonight. It's it's one of those deals that it's it's never. It's like warring factions of a tribe. You have so many different. I hate to say use the word cult, but so many different factions and and matters of opinion. Yeah. No, See, this true. one here, if you look, there's a series of them. Okay? I like this. I see Yeah, that's different. Yeah, when there's a series there's of them like and you can see right. movement. Yeah, but no, I agree. That's different. If I'm looking at this photo only, I right, would totally. say I would say that's a bear climbing a tree. Yep. But if it didn't because it happened in sequence. Yep. Okay, here you can see the legs, the length of the creature. All right. 
that looks cool to me. Yep, I agree. Yep. But it's still inconclusive. Still inconclusive. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But totally closer. Agree. We're closer. Yeah. Right? Or footprints like this. You can see the, the dermal edges right here. I love this stuff. To me, this is what I like. Justin's giving his professional opinion. It looks squatchy to him. <laughs> yeah, we can trust your research. Don't don't get me started on tracks. <laughs> hey, that's tracks cool. to me. Tr tracks to me are really interesting. I mean, tra especially when you can actually see the dermal ridges. I mean, uh, that that's that's oh, yeah. that's something else. I mean, that's that's really hard to fake. You can take all the all the. Uh, pictures and videos you want but man when i can get on a trail and start tracking them boy i just that's my my bread and butter like here we have somebody in in a in a scream mask in the trees and this guy this guy uh points out uh i really like all the comments even the humor but i really didn't hoax this i have no reason to waste your time or mine really that's that looks like a scream mask yeah. That's if I wanted to be a dink. You well, know what yeah, I'm saying? And the hard part too is, is that there, there are people that play jokes on each other, you know? It's like there's some great video of people like dressed up in costumes and messing with their buddy's trail cam, you know? Dressed up as Chewbacca. As a bear. Clear. You know? I mean, that's that's kind of the stuff we're dealing with. Yep. That's no, the giant. <laughs> the thing about it is, is, you know, I've heard some people say we're dealing with that and we got to break the cycle and stuff. We're not going to. There's two, and I hate to say this, and, and put, nobody please take this wrong. There's way too many uninformed, uh, enthusiastic uh, how would we say this? Uh, people out there looking for the subject. Absolutely. Yeah. The only way we're going to stop this is through education. But the problem is, is whose education do you use? You have so many, like y'all said, so many different opinions of what's real, what's not, what's real. So what, what do you teach? In yeah. And, and you, you almost have to get it down to a, you almost have to get it down to a quantifiable, uh, a quantifiable measurement uh, ability where you can say, look, you know, like, like we need, like we need, we need X number of pixels, <laughs> right? Like you, Very well. you need to have the, you know, some, just something, something yeah. like, and maybe that's a bad example, but just like, you know, so then you can say to someone, you know, Hey, it, it's not that I think your picture is false. It's not that I think your picture is bad. What I'm saying is that, that, oh, that I have a minimum criteria that I have to meet to 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 use it as data and and it just so happens your picture doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's a bad picture it just doesn't meet my criteria for data right and so you can make it a little less personal you know hi si. um, how are you you know because i mean there, there are some um you know it, it's well yeah but i mean you know the problem with with, with, it, with anything you get into hypotheses and you get into repeatable stuff is that a lot of people who see this stuff they see it once and they never see it again you know, it's, it's, it's a total chance encounter, you know, oh, it absolutely. makes it really difficult. Absolutely, dude. But the problem is people are, people are tired of getting the wool pulled over their eyes. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's harsh critics, uh, like a, uh, like a Steve Cambion or Rich Giordano. Yeah. Or, or if it's a, or if it's Mark D'Antonio from MUFON, or if it's, uh, you know, Joe or Jill public who are looking at it. They've had the, they've had the wool pulled over their eyes so much that they're just tired of, of BS, you know? Agreed. I mean, did I you guys many, see, did, no, sorry, go ahead. You know, like that, my image of this is there's no ass on that. Do, do you know how many different stories has come out in the past year about that? It's in Idaho. It's in Montana. It's in Oklahoma. It's in Florida. 
and but no, uh, agree. And, and this this one still may be complete complete nothing. But the what, all I was going to point out is is that this has uh, there's enough of whatever it is. There's enough of it in the picture, right? To do some kind of analysis, right? There's enough of it in the picture to make some sort of, especially because you you do have you know um, you know I've seen a couple of different pictures you know of it, right? And so you know so uh, all I'm pointing out is that you compare this to some of the pictures Dave was showing, where you just see some blackness in a bush and you see the a hint of a shoulder, right? Like that's that's really minimalistic, right? Whereas these, I think, are a little easier to come to determination of. Yes, that's good, or no, it's not. You know. But here's the problem you get, and, and I'm going to hit a subject that a lot of they'll make a lot of people upset. I'm sure. What creditable source or creditable science is going to put their reputation on something like this? in such a taboo it's not as taboo as it used to be but a taboo subject what do people understand and i know i'm gonna upset make some people upset but do people understand that people like dr john bendernagel dr jeffrey meldrum uh, science bob how what they're putting on the line when they put their credentials hundred oh, years yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars in education to put, okay, you take a photo analysis guy. So if, if I say that this picture right here is real, I'm a photo analysis expert. I say it's real. And then somebody comes out a, a year later and says, no, I faked it. This is how I faked it. There goes your livelihood. Oh yeah. Oh, totally agree. And let's face it. I mean, I, and I don't mean to take anything away from Bob because he has put a lot at risk, but he didn't do it till after he retired. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, so it's that? like, you know, so, I mean, there's some safety for him built in there. Right. Yeah. But you're right. If he needs to, if he tries to use anyone younger than that as, as during his investigation, so any kind of photo analysis, material analysis, anything where they have to stand up for the results, they're putting their careers at risk. Right. I mean, Gary Nolan's a great example. Gary Nolan is sticking his neck out. That guy. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever looked into what else he does like outside of what he does involving our community. But I mean, the guy has his own lab named after him at Stanford, right? Like, I mean, this guy is, he's like, he's, he, he, he walks on water at Stanford, right? He does. I mean, he, they, they adore him there, right? He's putting a tremendous amount at risk, tremendous amount. Well, all I was going to say about this picture is this This is another good example. And the, the story I heard about this one is that it was a, a, a photographer that took it. She, it was the only picture she got. She has no idea. She had no idea it was there when she took it. She has no idea what it is. Um, she never saw it again. So it's just one picture, right? And now to me, it, it looks like it might be something interesting, right? Like, I mean... It's certainly a large, you know, hairy something or other, right? Um, but it's one picture, right? And so I, how how much good can it really do, you know? Hey, Gary. Honestly, I've looked at that picture over and over and over and over, and we don't know the fauna kind of makes you think North America, but that could even be a chimp or something in, in northeastern Africa. You know, in certain, uh, you know, that when you look at the floral and fauna, that you know that I, wrong terminology. The floral. I agree, but man, that shoulder, Jesus Christ! What if I told yeah. you that that could very easily could also be a bear with his head stuck on the ground? Well, and that's what I heard. I heard, I heard that was a bear butt sticking in the air. <laughs> Dude, if you see some black bears, some of the cantankerous positions they get into to get turned. <laughs> and yeah. I'm telling you. Like the everybody knows the video that come out of the Florida of the 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 sub, alleged target species ripping the tree open that stands up and the guy runs. What does a oh, black yeah, bear do? Right. first thing if it's up next to a tree and they go after termites and honey? What are the first thing to do when they they hear something? They stand up on the side of the tree and they look. Well, this thing's back was to them. When the first thing when I seen that video, I'm thinking that's a black bear. I've seen black bears rip trees right. apart. That you know. Oh yeah. Question for you, Gary. <laughs> Mark in Australia, do you look at the metadata of a photo when you get photos sent to you? I am not a photography expert. I am just learning photography. I literally look at the bio. What I know is the biomechanics of animals. 
I, I do like and and the and the behavior of an animal. I don't look like when I see this, the shoulders and everything that is spooky to me because the way it's built. But I look at the bio, the biomechanics of the animal, and I look at it. When I think Sasquatch, when he's standing out in the middle of the open, I throw it out the window right off the bat. I think I was, I, in my own theory, yeah, that's walking, yeah, fair. It's going to be four or five layers into the trees, yeah. looking at you from behind the tree. And I think, guys, the other thing we want to we want to uh, uh, look at too here is people in the community. Doesn't matter whether it's paranormal, whether it's. Uh, Bigfoot, Dogman, UFOs, aliens, we get off on debunking things. We want to be the guy. Some of us do, yeah. That's not real. That's on a string. That's a bear. That's a that's a uh, a mongoose. That's a a uh, wolverine. That's a dog. We want to be the guy, the person who debunks it all. When I, one of us are really experts, but I'm not saying all of us, Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a good portion who have large YouTube channels, who have small YouTube channels, who have uh, pull within MUFON, pull within the BFRO, pull within a lot of different communities. Okay, who are look who are doing this? I mean, look at look at Seth Stoshak in the UFO community for for SETI research. Search for extra intelligence, uh, whatever the TI stands for. Yep, yep. No, he 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 he's getting off on it. He's like, it's. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, look how egotistical he became over that. And you know, it's funny. Like, I, I think I've told you, but you, I mean, I mean, I I I talked to him about this in person, one on one, in 2018. Okay, because the SETI's headquarters is in Mountain View which is where I grew up and I live in Sunnyvale, just one town over and SETI, the building they're in, they had to, um, they had to get rid of some of their, their space. And so they stopped holding a lot of the SETI meetings at SETI headquarters. And now where they hold them is at SRI, right? Cause SRI is just right over in Palo Alto. So a lot of the SETI meetings I go to are, are at SRI. So I'm at SRI's campus. Uh, you got to go through armed security to get to get to the auditorium, and uh, show ID and everything. And uh, and I, I you know, when, and I notice Seth walk out, right? So I follow him, right? And I catch him outside, you know, just one on one. And I'm like, hey, do you have a minute? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, hey, have you have you seen these these Navy videos, right? Because this was like maybe six months. It's like you know, this is probably in like late summer of 2018. So they. You know, the first video had only been out a little while. And I'm like, you know, have you seen this Navy video? And, and he's like, um, he's like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, my understanding is that it's it's nothing. And I'm like, but no, but have you seen it? And he's like, well, no, I, I haven't myself. But, but but I have people who have watched it, you know, watched it and they report to me and they've told me it's nothing. And I'm like, OK, but but so you haven't been in all this press. You haven't watched that video. And he's like. Well, no, I, I don't need to. Like my, my guys told me that it's nothing, and he was not being flippant. He was being completely serious. Like as far as he was concerned, it was case closed. Like there was no point in looking into it any further. I mean, the lack of curiosity, the lack of just of just plain old personal curiosity, blew my mind. Like, mm -hmm. Absolutely blew gonna, my mind. I mean, you know what? I, I really bugged me. When I worked in sports radio, I worked for my sports director was an asshole, just a complete asshole. I learned a lot off of him, and I'll always be grateful for that, but he was the most miserable prick I had ever worked for, and I could never figure it out because here we are, we have the ultimate fan job. Right. Okay, we got into all the hockey games for free, all the football games for free, all the basketball games for free. When the Indy race was in Vancouver, we got into that for free. Okay, we got everything for free. Man, I didn't pay for a round of golf in ten, nearly 10 years. <coughs> okay, and wow. he was miserable. 
every day he was fucking miserable. And the reason why I bring that up is it reminds me of Seth Stoshak. You are getting paid very right. good money, very good money to be the head and the voice and the face of SETI. And here you are blowing off, and I realize you're contracted by NASA, okay? But you are in charge of the biggest story in humankind's history, and all you can do is present denial. I know. Your entire job is to find that one piece of evidence. NASA has given you a bunch of money and a bunch of big satellites to find something. If we played by the rules. Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't any backdoor dealings. Because right, I right, right. Okay? And yet you are miserable. Everything's a hoax. There's nothing out there. Your job is to find something. Whether it's a little radio frequency coming from Zeta Reticuli, or whether it's a photo or something moving across the sky like Oumuamua. Stop, you're not there to be a debunker. You are there to find that anomalous thing that doesn't make sense. We're not saying UFO or UAP. Yes. Find the anomaly. Yep. And, and in, know. in 30 years on the job, he found zero. And then the, he, the wow signal. That was it. And then he poo-poos absolutely everything that everybody else has. Yep. Okay. Yep. Whether it's home video, whether it's the Navy, whether it's home photograph well, or anything. And I tell you what, what, what really motivated me to get up and chase him out of this building was the fact that I, I, I went to this SETI meeting and, and, you know, these SETI meetings are, you know, especially this one's happened over the summer. They're cool, right? They're in this beautiful auditorium at, at SRI, right? It's like a sloped seating, you know, and basically what, what happens is NASA people come and give reports on missions, right? So like the Cassini probe that, you know, that was going around that they crashed into, um, uh, I think they crashed into Saturn when they were done. Anyway, big, big giant uh, spaceship, right? They, they came in and that team, some members of that team came in and gave us the most amazing presentation showing us amazing photos. And they try so hard to show this really current research right when it's happening. And we got through the whole thing and, no one had said anything about the Navy video, like not even a blip, not even a, oh, and by the way, did you guys hear about this? Right. Like, like, like it was, they all behaved as if like nothing was happening, like nothing. And I'm thinking like, you guys are set, SETI, right? Like yeah. search for extra, like that search for these things and someone might've found them and you don't care because they aren't broadcasting on AM. I mean, I, I just, oh, but I was just, that's uh, okay. it's like, <clears throat> it's like my former sports director. Okay. Where he was, he, I would watch him get pissed off. Oh God. I got to go to a, another press conference today where there's free food and drinks and he would be miserable, miserable. <laughs> You're getting paid at that point pretty good money at $65,000 a year to cover sports. Sports. You get to go into the dressing room to talk to the athlete. No. You get you get full access to the arena. You could go anywhere with that press pass. And you're miserable. Like it's a chore. And he wasn't the only one. He wasn't the only one. There were others. But I mean, man, getting paid sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars a year to cover sports. Hmm. I was making thirty grand a year, and I was the happiest person on earth, man, because I had the press pass. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. I had the press pass and I got to, my job was for people to listen to me about my analysis of a hockey game or a football game or a baseball. But you know, 
I, I bet you that exists in each. I mean, I, I bet you in the in the music world, you know, there's a bunch of people that do that press passes for for concerts, and you know, maybe you know, maybe eighty percent of them love it, but there's some percentage of them that are like, it's just a job, you know, it's just a, oh, an annoying guys, job. I fully, I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. So sad. But what I'm saying though is, when you have a great job, like for instance, if the Canadian government which I believe has a UFO group hasn't been proven, but I just have a feeling that there is one. If I well, ever, they've, they've certainly had one at certain points in history yeah. and it would seem but, weird that they would ever get rid of it. But if I ever got asked, if they came up to me and said, would you leave spaced out radio to take a job with our UFO group? Gone. Can you imagine no Can offense you imagine? to all our listeners and everything. I'm oh, gone. How cool would that be? Okay. If anyone's listening out there, you know what? I'm 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 rather free right now, so just side note. You know, so <laughs> that's, that's, but guys, that's what I'm saying. Okay, like like somebody like Seth Stoshak should be appreciative for what he what he got. The only thing that I could think of is that he had to turn anything that would make him miserable would be that if he had to be silent on any information that he found and had to turn it over to the Pentagon. That's it. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because, I mean, SETI was was NASA funded for many years. And uh, and then uh, Congress basically decided to cut that funding off. I think it was in the I think it was in the early 80s. I think it was a while ago. And um, and Paul Allen of Microsoft um, ended up um, giving a ton of money um, to SETI. I mean, a lot of money to SETI, and uh, and you know that they, they basically have been living off of of donations, um, you know, to 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 keep going. But outside of that, if you if you look at the people at SETI, what it what it started to appear to me after going to, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't been going recently, but I was going to a lot of SETI meetings. It seems to be where, you know, cause we have a huge NASA complex in Mountain View called, called NASA Ames. Right. And, um, and it, it's, it's very hush hush. I mean, like you, it's, 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 um, I mean, I've been in there a couple of times, but for the most part, the public's not allowed in. Um, when they built space camp, they built space camp outside of the fence. <laughs> of NASA Ames. And I think when those when people from NASA Ames retire, if they don't move away, if they stay in the area, they go work at SETI. It seems like it's just a a place where NASA people move to right after they retire. And so depending on what sort of culture has been grown at NASA about aerial phenomenon, mm -hmm. I I have to believe that a lot of that culture just just gets transported right over into SETI, which is not necessarily the culture you want. Well, guys, it is that time where we are going to say good night. Uh, we went a half an hour longer than what I thought we were going to go. Uh, I want to say I got to work in the morning. So, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so, it is morning here. It's four o'clock in the morning here. Yeah. <laughs> Your mustache says you're, it's only midnight. <laughs> you're a trooper man says that i'm fixing to take my butt to bed because i gotta be up in three hours <laughs> oh uh Oof. i john thank you for staying late as per usual uh gary thank you for joining us with your incredible yeah. insight nice to have you with us man appreciate that uh, i want to say a big thank you tonight to aussie steve magnus spooky g west cat kira brian gf 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 g uh, Linda, Swampy, Bat Mom, Murray, and Black Dragon for the amazing super chats tonight. Love you guys. Thank you so much for your continued support of Spaced Out Radio. Uh, thank you for being with us for a wonderful week. Uh, Gary will be in covering for Lynn, who's uh, making her way back home from vacation tomorrow. <clears throat> and uh, Lynn will be back on, on Sunday. Uh, Gary's guest tomorrow night, or later on tonight, Mr. Gorga. What a Mr. Gorga is, I don't know, but it's going to be a great show talking demonology, demons, paranormal, all yep, night. Everyone long. come out and support Gary. 
Yeah, everybody come on out Sport Gary. This is first time in the hot seat. Lynn will be back on Sunday with Samantha Mowat. I'm back on Monday with Nora oh, Funk cool. talking ET contact. So we got a, a big weekend coming up and a, another power week next week. Our team is working really hard behind the scenes to make uh, everything uh, look really good for you guys. Um, thank you to my great team. Thank you to all the veterans out there listening to us. And uh, we love you. You always have a safe home with us at Spaced Out Radio. Thank you to all the regulars who uh, we keep up until all stupid hours of the night sometimes. We appreciate you. And uh, I will talk to you guys next week. And uh, hopefully Monday will be the launch of our new website. And I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, we're going to call it the night. And much love to each and every one of you. And uh, uh, don't forget to come in and support Gary tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. And uh, give him a lot of love because he's going to be a little nervous tomorrow. That's okay. We still love him. We still love him. We'll talk to you guys later.